You say, I say, or you say, ka, or ka, or ka, killer, ka. <laughs> you say whale, whale. <laughs> I say killer. You say whale, killer. You say whale. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Everybody and welcome back to Critically Acclaimed, the podcast where highbrow and lowbrow collide. <clears throat> yeah, we need like a mid '90s explosion sound effect. Yeah, we need like a Law and Order chunk chunk. It, it's the boom. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Here comes the boom. Ready or not? Oh God. Uh, my name is William Bibiani. We're off the rails already. My name is William Bibiani. I am a film <laughs> critic. People call me Bibbs. My it. name. My name is. They call you Bibbs. Damn it. Call me Bibbs. Damn it. My name is Whitney Seibold. I, too, am a film critic, and they call me Mr. Tibbs. Hi, Mr. Tibbs. How do you do, sir? Hello. <laughs> I have um, some apricots for you. <laughs> uh, this week on Critically Acclaimed... I don't know why, that, that, I don't know why Mr. Tibbs is doing that. This week on Critically Acclaimed, we're reviewing yet another double feature of one of the worst movies ever made, as chosen by you, our listeners, on the Schmoville Facebook fan page. We're going to pair that up with a good but rather obscure movie that I mm-hmm. hope you'll all check out after we do this podcast. Uh, and we also have a bunch of new movies to review, including 12 Strong, mm-hmm. Forever My Girl, and Mary and the Witch's Flower. And it's January. Yeah. And boy, is it ever. Yeah, there's a lot of now, January in these movies. We, uh, as we were, we saw one of these films together in yes, a late, late Thursday night screening because uh, we couldn't make it to the critic screening. I don't think there was I don't a think critic there screening were of Forever My Girl. For Forever My Girl. Why don't you start with Forever My Girl? Sure, well, I, I just wanted to point out that until this week, this has been an uncharacteristically good January. Yeah, or at least not terrible January. Not, not terrible. You know, usually we have, like, some crappy Underworld sequel or mm. some crappy Resident Evil Kangaroo sequel. Jack or, 5 yeah. comes out. And or some... Triple X is back for some reason. Well, Triple X actually wasn't that bad last it, it, year. Yeah, that's true. It wasn't <laughs> it's that bad. kind of fun. But uh, ordinarily, you got your nut jobs and you got your labor days and all kinds of just horrible, horrible crap. Real crap. And uh, so far, we've had stuff like Paddington 2, which, as it turns out, is... As of this recording, the single best reviewed film on all of Rotten Tomatoes, huh. like in its history, like more than Lady Bird, more than Lady Bird. So one grouch came on Lady Bird and gave it a negative review. I mean, oh, what a jerk! I'm not sure if they were just being contrarian or if they genuinely just felt it wasn't a good film. But yeah, well, either yeah. way, it it doesn't matter. But uh, but anyway, like uh, we had Proud Mary last week, and usually even that was like just okay. Uh, it was yeah, terrible. I mean, it, it, uh, it wasn't so bad that I was you know slamming my head against the wall. It was just disappointing. Insidious, the last key was like an adequate horror matinee, yeah, kind of unremarkable, uh, and, but and, nothing and you'd want to ask your money back. And there have been a few like really notable indies as well. So. I was thinking, foolishly, it turns out, (laughs) that this January might not be so bad. And then January, late to the party, (laughs) kicked the door in. (laughs) Hey, I brought my own whiskey, puked on the floor. (laughs) Dropped his whiskey bottle on my chair, ruining it forever. Started cussing at all of the party guests and said, ah, we're finally at home. <laughs> January has arrived. Um, and Jan- the, the, the party can now begin. And it arrived with a little film called Forever My Girl. Hello, Forever My Girl. Thank you, Forever My Girl, yeah. because you were the film I totally suspected you would be. <laughs> <laughs> Just as bad as we thought. There are other movies, there are action movies coming out this yeah. weekend, but Forever My Girl was the one I was like, there is no way in fucking hell I am missing this, because it's either going to be, eh, okay, like better than you'd think, uh-huh. or it's going to be gloriously awful, and it was the latter. Nah. Uh, Forever My Girl uh, is... So it's about... Liam Page, yes. played by Alex Rowe, and Alex Rowe has been in films before. Sure has. Um, been pretty good in them before, actually. He's he's not good in this. No. In fact, he's quite bad in this. This is a really bad performance he's been asked to give. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know and how much is him, how much is the director, he, but it did not turn out well. He plays a country music star who is, uh, the story is he goes back to his hometown, we'll get to the rest of it. Yeah. Um, my suspicion is, and I said this when we were walking out, that they actually had a real country star cast in this role, some young country star hotshot. Mm-hmm. And when the, you cast a pop star, you kind of have to roll the dice as to whether or not they can act. Some can, some cannot. Mm-hmm. Typically, you just ask them to play some version of themselves. Usually. Look at the early works of Madonna mm-hmm. or David Bowie. And they're get, pretty much playing some version of themselves. You get David Bowie, you find, actually, he has some kind of act, acting chops. But early there. on, he was asked to play Bowie-esque ethereal presences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, then you Madonna get something like to play punks and, you get and something like Crossroads, where Britney Spears shows that she can't play somebody who's not Britney Spears. Uh, and even when she was playing Britney Spears, when she got to the point where she was more like Britney Spears, mm. still not very convincing. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really bad movie. My guess is that Alex Rowe, who is maybe a capable enough actor, intuited this. And decided to play the role as if he were a real country star who was also a bad actor. See, my theory is, <laughs> I buy that, my theory is oh. Alex Rowe decided to skip his performance entirely and go straight to the performance that Dave Franco would one, ga- would one day give, making in, fun in of Alex Rowe's of performance. kind of performance. Like, it's just so much of the movie. So the plot of the movie is really simple. Hmm. Alex, this is a PG rated film, yeah. so there's there's no edge or real any kind of it's, serious this is, complications. This is, this is a sappy Nicholas Sparks type movie. Mm-hmm. Some of those Nicholas Sparks movies can be very good in their own right, in, as in, part of their bizarre maybe in their melodram- context. Well, but yeah, there's a they're a melodramatic subgenre where every mm-hmm. all the emotions are heightened. All of the drama that doesn't have to do with whether or not we're perfect for each other mm-hmm. is really minimal. Mm-hmm. Like it's just pretty straightforward lovey-dovey melodrama. There's a market for that and there's a way to do it well. We've all seen it done well and we've all seen it done really bad. Hmm. And, and you and I just saw it done really yeah, bad. There you go. Uh, so, uh, it takes place in a small town. I mm-hmm. think it's St. Augustine. It's in... Uh, St. Louisiana. Yeah, it's in Louisiana. They call it St. Because apparently there's only one St. something <laughs> in Louisiana. It's just a nickname. It's fine. Uh, well, we live in L.A., for goodness sake. No, okay. Uh, so, we don't call it loss. We call it L.A., which is a dumb abbreviation for Los Angeles, <laughs> but all right. In any case, uh, he's from a small town, and on like the day his first single blows up on the radio, he's going to be a huge star. Mm. He was also supposed to get married to a young woman played by Jessica Roth, uh, who you may recall as the star of Happy Death Day. And she's great. She's great even in this, which is pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, but instead of going through with the wedding, he leaves her at the altar. Cut to eight years later, and he has become a dickbag. He is a a big old country star. Mm -hmm. He uh, is rude to all the people backstage. He likes to grab a bottle of booze on the way back to his room and just sort of crash out and be depressed. And occasionally sleeps with a groupie, but it's PG-rated film, so they're just sort of in the room. It's possible they only cuddled. Yeah, possible they only cuddle, and, and there's not a lot of like actual on-screen drinking. He's just sort of holding the bottle a lot. Yeah, uh, and uh, he also has mm. an old flip phone that he refuses to upgrade. Yeah, it's like an eight-year-old phone. He's had it since high school. It all like the groupie he cuddled with mm. uh, stepped on it, so he immediately she, runs she, out of the she, hotel. She jumped for joy and jumped on it repeatedly, and she was surprised to learn that it was a cell phone because she didn't mm. know what it was. Because it's such an old phone. And she didn't <laughs> notice that there was something under her foot, so she just kept jumping on it. So the cell phone's it's broken. It's a good thing it wasn't a pet. He runs out of the hotel like hard day's night, mm. running down the street. People are chasing so after him. so famous that people start chasing after yeah, he's barefoot. him. barefoot. to be fair, this film has already established that he is one big hunk of steak, this guy. <laughs> Like, he, he he is a nice, fine slice of butt steak, this man, with mm. eyeballs and, and I don't know. big, I'd say heavy brow. I'd say he's medium. He's medium. Just medium. <laughs> He's not well, that's for They're sure. Certainly not rare. Hey! Um, yeah, there's like there was already a shot of him sort of rolling over in bed with his big hunky washboard abs. And you can hear the entire audience the go, <sighs> Oh my <laughs> boy, but I do have the vapors. So yeah, he he runs out, he gets his phone fixed, and we learn that it's so he can listen to a message mm-hmm. that he hasn't bothered to like move to a laptop or anything. Mm-hmm. Just has it on his phone. In some way. He he works in a recording studio most of the year. Never mm-hmm. occurred to him to maybe like put that on an MP3 just um, in case. Now, to be fair, he's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> He's a dumb man. He is. That's he, his character. He, it's his character is that point. he's dumb. It's an important plot point. His, he his, doesn't know how his own credit cards work at some point. He has, yeah. he has to call his agent to explain it to him. <laughs> he does, yeah, he Do I have credit cards? He does, how are credit cards? He doesn't know how money works, even though he's blindingly rich. His his eight put upon agent also deals with Blake Shelton, who's a big big star, who you called Blake Seven at one point and made me giggle. I I was I've heard the name Blake Shelton, mm-hmm. but every time I hear it, I want to hear I want to say like Blake Snyder or Blake Lively. Uh, Blake Shelton is a really big country star. That's so what I'm you told. Need to know. I I um, gave up on so country when Bobby Bear died. But yeah, he he does he doesn't drive himself. He doesn't know how to do much of anything except sing country songs and drink. 
Uh, and he's kind of a dim bulb, and he's played like he's kind of a dim bulb. That's the whole point. Yeah, that he, he's one of those guys who's so good looking, he's never bothered to learn any skills. Uh, I, I actually owe Bobby Bear an apology, because mm. Bobby Bear is still very much alive. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad I checked. I was All like, right. Bobby Bear, wait, Bobby Bear's alive. Because I haven't heard him working in a while. Yeah, he's 82 so, years old. Uh, Going the, strong, one of the best country singers ever. Listen to Bobby Bear's songs. That's all go, I'm going to say. Go Bobby Bear. Yeah, that's all. I had to take a moment. Drop Kick Me Jesus is a song <laughs> that I love. Through the goalposts alive. <laughs> I uh, love that song. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, uh, Plot Point Man, mm-hmm. and in, in his hometown, dies in a car yes. wreck. Old high school uh, friend. Old high school friend. Had one, line, one or two lines of dialogue in the prologue. And, dies off camera. Dies off camera. So he decides to go back to St. Louisiana mm-hmm. to visit, to uh, kind of haunt the funeral. He doesn't attend the funeral. Okay, there's a couple of things, there's a couple of things going on here. One, I just want to say that the death of this small town guy in like a drunk driving accident, uh, which is a tragedy, yeah. is top of the hour news in New Orleans radio. Yeah, like, I love like that. He's as in a, New Orleans and he not, hears it on the radio. It's not just like, oh, a tragedy occurred in the local town of St. Augustine, like, known as St., where a man died in a tragic drunk driving accident, blah, 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 blah. And, and his it, name was Blah, his family was Blah, uh, here's an important history of his, it. His, his family is very sad, and he wished that his best friend, the country star, would come visit him at his funeral. It might as well be. Yeah. He, goes to the, he goes to the town, and you're right, he haunts the funeral. There's this tree that I've seen in so many movies. If you've ever seen a movie with a funeral... <laughs> There's always like there's a shot of the funeral and the priest mm. is giving the 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 eulogy. I almost said soliloquy. He's giving the mm. eulogy, and there's a shot of the mourners. Two actors you recognize, a whole bunch of extras who I guess just knew the guy and was sad. Mm. And then you cut to the tree, mm. the tree that's like that's like fifty yards away and is only there in the in the cemetery. The landscapers put it there mm. so that people could like attend the funeral without being from seen. a distance. Yeah. I, I, someone needs to do a super cut of all the times we've seen like important people like Nightmare on Elm Street 3 where Freddy's ghost mom shows up behind that tree. <laughs> I, I've I'd seen that tree see a, so many times. I'd love to see a parody of that scene where the person is getting buried right next to the tree. So everybody's like gathered around the grave and the guy's like peeking out behind, it's, but he's like right next to the tomb. And like, you can come out. He's, he's right here. We, 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 can hear, we know you're there. We see you. Um, anyway, he goes. Everyone thinks he's an asshole. And indeed he is. In fact, mm. one of the first things that happens is Jessica Rose punches him in the stomach at the funeral. Right, right in the solar plexus. <laughs> Just boom! And he keels over. And it's really he, satisfying. And uh, so he, he has no place to stay. I guess there's no ho- like Motel 6 in well, Saints. His dad, but his dad, dad is the local preacher. His dad is the local pastor, and so he stays with his dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't know about anything. It, like He grew up in this town, mm-hmm. but he doesn't know how to get around. Yeah. Like he, he has to have his agent send him a send car. Send him a like he, he asks, doesn't know how to get a car. He asks his dad, "Do we have Uber in this town?" Mm. I want to stop you right there because on your shitty eight year old flip phone, you can't get the Uber <laughs> app. <laughs> Wait, how, Uber doesn't exist for you anyway. How does he know about Uber if he doesn't know about you know smartphones or technology? But he does know about espresso machines. Oh, absolutely. So mm. he gets his dad an espresso machine because because small town coffee is bullshit. Apparently. <laughs> He goes to see Jessica Roth, who has taken over the local uh, uh, flower, flower shop. shop. Yeah, she's a florist now. And she's telling him off, and it's really satisfying, because Jessica Roth is a really good actor. Like, I love her so much. I hope she has a huge career. There's like, two she, kinds, She's the reason Happy Death Day was so enjoyable, There's really. two kinds of, like, movie stars. There's uh, movie stars who are really good at playing themselves, and that's it. And if they don't... Tom Cruise. That Tom Cruise is an example of this. Or actually, Tom Cruise, maybe not even so much. I'm thinking something like... Um, uh, Van Damme. Van Damme. I'm trying to think of someone who can't elevate shitty material. Okay. You throw them in a bad script. Like, Tom Cruise has elevated bad movies. Mm. Uh, but, like, you know, there are certain actors who they can't make a bad role good. Mm. Jessica Rose can make a bad role good. Yeah. She yeah. can make an underwritten role full of life and character. We just talked about uh, on our other show, Cancel Too Soon. We This week we're reviewing Law & Order in Los Angeles, and Corey Stoll from The Strain and Ant-Man was in it. And it's <laughs> a kind of a nothing role, just has to interrogate people, and he brings so much vibrancy to mm. it. He's, he's actually kind of a funny guy. Jessica Rose brings a lot of character to it. Alex Rowe brings none. Mm. So for most of the movie, like the first half of the movie, just people telling him what a shithead he is and him just kind of staring dumbly like, and going, yeah. yeah he's like a, a wooden skull. He's a tree. He's just yeah. this big hunk of wood. Just like, yeah, yeah hunk of I wood, know. And, wood and meat, and that's all he's got. I'm made of poo. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty bad at being man. <laughs> <laughs> and then it turns out he has a daughter. 
She was pregnant when they uh, were getting married. He didn't know. She and the message she left on the phone was her saying, "Call me back. It's important to tell you. And if you don't call me back, I'll, I'm just going to leave it right here." Yeah. And it turns out she was calling him so that if he called her back, she'd tell, let him know you have a daughter. No, oh, well, j- at the time I'm pregnant, but yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. And he didn't know. And then he tells, he goes up to his dad. His one moment of righteous indignation. Mm. Yeah, she's like, "Hey, I'm kind of the aggrieved party too. Someone really good of like, Dad, why didn't you tell me you live mm. in this small town?" Dad said, "I literally told you. I, I did. Like, I I actually told you several times. Like, it's a really great speech." His dad says, "Well, I went to your concert and I had to wait backstage. I'm your you know, I'm your father, but I had to do that, and it was really annoying. And you were there, and you were really out of it. And I told you, and you said, "Ah." So I went to another concert, and I told you then, and you said, "Ah." So. <laughs> I did my due diligence, you so asshole. Drunk. He was so drunk, he forgot he was a father. Mm. <laughs> that's that's pretty dr- drunk. That's quite drunk. That should be a sobering mm. moment. Uh, re- that remember? should be a shot of black coffee. That should be like, ooh, what? Huh? Did, did you see that film Rockstar with Mark Wahlberg? I did see that movie Rockstar. Remember, like, to depict that he was, like, really out of it on drugs, he just sort of, like, staggered up to her and looked a little dizzy? Like, he, <laughs> like he's not, his face isn't coated in coke. It's a PG-13 rated film. You right. can't show him, like, doing lines of coke off a hooker. You can't show real depravity. So you have to have this like kind of toothless version of depravity. Right. <laughs> that, Pretty that, great. He was that kind of drunk. <laughs> so he decides to stay oh. in town and try to be a better dad to his daughter. Now, there's a, a scene where mom is going to tell daughter that this mysterious man who was stalking the funeral that she punched. <laughs> uh, who seemed it, very surprised to find out that she had a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, there's a, a scene where they're having breakfast and she's going to do it. She's going to tell, you know what, that strange man is your father. So she's like, honey, I have something to tell you. That strange man is my father, isn't he? Why, yes, wise eight-year-old. Yeah, whatever, mom. You know, you didn't hide it you well. Know, you guys suck at hiding things. This girl... <laughs> I mean... I'm not going to say she's like a sterling young actress. She's, she's fine. She, she's not. She's a little clunky. She's well written. But she, she's well written, and boy, that actress has balls. <laughs> <laughs> like, she looks like she's about to, like, strangle someone at any given she's moment. Always she has t- that much strength. Every single line of dialogue she has, she doesn't always deliver it well. Uh-huh. Like, she's not delivering it with a lot of nuance. Sometimes you see an actor who's young and has clearly, like, lived beyond their years mm-hmm. and, like, has, like, like, like Dakota Fanning and, like, Man on Fire. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. she's so damn precocious and like he mm. seems like a small adult in a pretty young person's body this is a young person performance this mm. is but it's sassy enough and she gets to tell all these people off who are doing stupid things so even if delivery isn't great we're just sort of like yeah stick it to the man it's pretty great so um, the, the rest the rest of the film is essentially a prodigal son story yeah he left son returns he, he left he prodigal son returns and the people are very open and willing to forgive him of his sins. Now, if he were a little bit more soulful and remorseful about his actions, the drama would play better. Mm. But he is such a dummy and such yeah. a blank slate, and he's played so badly that you're wondering... What do people see in it? Yeah, what, what is it? I, I understand that the whole point of the Prodigal Son story is it doesn't matter how wasteful he was. You welcome him back because he's back. He bothered mm-hmm. to come back, and that's what you should be celebrating. Right. Um, and he was plenty prodigal. He has a, <laughs> he has a, a, a helicopter that he takes into town at one mm. point. He's plenty rich. Yeah. And he's willing and, to give it all up. And, and he's, he's willing, willing to give it all up and go to, back and to being a dad. Move, and also, oh, uh, something we forgot to mention is that he has writer's block. Oh, yeah. His, his next record is due any minute now. So, of course. And he's so... Evidently, he's such a prima donna that he can just cancel the last tour on his concert. Last, 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 con- con- last concert on this leg of his tour. Yeah. And just, he not, does that twice. and just not show up. He does that twice. What is he, fucking Morrissey? You don't get to do... Only Morrissey gets to do that, okay? <laughs> and Morrissey can just do it like, I was sad. I was and everyone sad would be like, well, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> That's, we, he, he's on brand. We, <laughs> he's we knew, on brand. We knew what we were doing when we were buying tickets, Morrissey. <laughs> You say he's you say he's a dummy, and he is. Mm. Um, <laughs> but like, and and he's he's vapid, and there's nothing to him, and it's really frustrating. What I will say, and I do kind of like this, mm. he is absolutely floored by his own overwhelming sense of shame. Yeah, and like, I appreciate like he, that. He, like he hasn't felt that before. I, I've seen like a whole bunch of these. The, uh, um, I've heard them rather clunkily called "indifference to concern" movies, mm. where the whole arc is someone is a bad person and then they become a better person over the course of the narrative. Right. Everything from a Christmas Carol to as good as it gets to everything in between. Um, he's that's the arc he's on. He 
has a couple of scenes where he's just ugly crying on a couch <laughs> just because he thinks he's the worst human being in the world. Mm. And he's not technically, he's the worst human being in the film. <laughs> and as a result, the context is like, yeah, you know what? <clears throat> At least he's taking it seriously. Like, there's a part where like he almost like he doesn't notice that his daughter like is choking. Uh huh. And her and, and he s- looks at her choking for a second and just sort of gets up and regards her for a second because yeah. he he panics. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. And and uh, sure enough, uh, Jessica Rhodes' brother, who doesn't like him, mm. is there. He actually sees her choke first, mm. runs over, starts giving her the Heimlich, and afterwards he gives this guy shit. And I'm like, okay, you noticed it first. I should have noticed it first. I was closer. Granted, you were giving her the Heimlich. What was I supposed to do? Mm. Pull you aside? Yeah, knock him over and start doing the Heimlich? No, yeah, I want to do this. You're already doing it. Like, what am I supposed to do? Meanwhile, like, the, the, an, meanwhile the daughter's turning purple. Yeah, yes. like, it's a shitty situation. Anything like that, where your mm. child is, is threatened and there's not much you can do because someone else is already doing it. What do you do? You want to do something? You know, that, that's why, like, they have all, always have that scene in the emergency room in movies where the doctors, you know, t- t- pull the crying parents off. I know you're trying to be a good parent, but the best thing you can do is get the fuck out. Mm. Like that. He was already doing that. It's kind of, like, kind of mean to hold him, whatever. <laughs> this movie is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> this oh, movie and, is and dumb forgot, and treacly. And we and, forgot the plot point that she's also a musical genius. Oh, the daughter is. The yeah. daughter is. Like, he hands her a guitar. The first time she's ever held a guitar and she's playing it expertly. Yeah. And I'm like... You know what? Fucking fine. <laughs> I'm <laughs> you know, fine with there, it. There's a, a version of this movie made by David Wayne where she just like starts doing <laughs> Django right hard in that moment. We're overdue for like a really spot on satire yeah. of this Nicholas Sparks kind of stuff. Like we never had like a date movie kind of parody. Obviously, that would be the shitty version of it. Mm. Like the superhero uh, movie, epic there's, movie. There's, there's a... There's, There's a good, good spoof movie still to be made, people. If you, you know, the genre is not dead. They well, say, I guess it is. No, it's it's it, no, it's still around. It's just mostly gone TV. No. A lot of people said like the romantic comedy is dead, and every year there's another romantic comedy that proves it's not. It is, however, slumbering a bit. Yeah. But there is a brilliant, spot on, flew under everyone's radar parody of the heyday of romantic comedies, the You've Got Mail mm. romantic comedies called yeah. They, they Came, Came Together, together. <laughs> starring Paul Rudd and Amy Poehler. Amy Poehler. Directed by David Wayne, written uh, co-written by Michael Showalter, who directed The Big Sick. Mm. That is mercilessly funny. <laughs> that is, if you if you ever had to sit through like more than two mm. like Meg Ryan-y kind uh. of nineties rom coms, <laughs> you recognize everything they do in it, mm. and it is genius. Well, let us tell you the story of how we met. We met in New York, and New York is kind of like a character in this story. <laughs> like they say that in dialogue, and like eighty times yeah. they say that. Mm. That's like, oh, we have nothing in common, and then they find out they do have one thing in common. They like fiction books. <laughs> <laughs> I love fiction too. I thought I was the only person who liked fiction books. <laughs> Great. Okay, so it, it, Forever My Girl. Here's the deal. The Forever joke is thin in that film, but it's a good. Joke. It's really funny if you're a fan of romantic comedies. Uh, Forever My Girl. Kind of a dumb movie. It's it's, it's it's entertainingly bad though. I've seen versions of this, these Nicholas Sparksy kind of movies, yeah. which are just death to sit through. What was the one we saw uh, last year? The Vow. The was it, it was, the Vow? Was it the Vow? Ah, uh, something like the, that. The, the, the promise. promise of the, the, it ended in a magic gazebo. Like yeah, I'm just like, one. no, no, thank you. It's just sort of death to sit through. The, no, it's, it's called so, the choice. The choice. It's called that the choice. The vow. I think was the Channing Tatum one about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the choice is a really painful one to sit through. Like it's a really bad. Yeah, movie. It, it was tough. Yeah, and, uh, and that one is like. Nicholas Sparks. That is literally so that Nicholas Sparks. Literally, That's Nicholas bad Sparks. Nicholas Sparks. There's good Nicholas Sparks. Mm. Safe Haven is hilarious this Nicholas is, Sparks. This is a Nicholas Sparks knockoff, yeah. and it feels like a Nicholas Sparks knockoff. The it's like, only good thing in it is the female lead. Jessica Roth is Roth really talented. Is, and she's she's destined for good things. Keep an eye on her. Yeah. Wa- don't watch this, though. Watch Happy Death Day instead, because that's actually a really good it's film. A, it's, it's a really, really like, clever, fun uh, horror comedy, and it's a great role for her, because she gets to play everything. Yeah. Every kind of part you can play, and she's she got plays a, it all together. And even when she's like being horrible, she has a that sort of Bill Murrayish charm. So it, yeah, which I only use because it's the same story as Groundhog Day. But yeah, well, yeah, well, B- Bill Murray can play sort of a cad that you kind of root for. Yeah, and you don't see that kind of character played well often enough, and she does it perfectly. So in that movie. Uh, let's talk about the other movie we saw together, Twelve Strong. Twelve Strong. Well, we didn't see it together, but we did both see this. We both one. saw. It. We um, we can both talk about yeah. it from experience. Mm. Uh, 12 Strong is, 
I guess enough time has elapsed since uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. At least since they started. Since they started. That uh, we can now tell really bold, romanticized versions of them. What are you talking about? We've been doing that for so long. You see Act of Valor? Well, I suppose so. But even Act of Valor, like, did treat these wars as as if they were really kind of gritty and there was a lot of complexity to them and the bravery Mm -hmm. was the thing that could cut through that complexity. Okay. Um. And then, you know, right as those wars were starting, we had films from like filmmakers like Paul Greengrass, like The Green Zone or, mm. or stuff like United 93 that was really taking like tackling the politics and the confusion we were I, feeling at the time. I think they were trying and to turn them into a, like a cinematic grit. I think there uh, was in, an ex- in response. I think the immediate response mm. was not to romanticize, was to talk about the hot button political issues that were surrounding yeah. those conflicts, which they're still ongoing and still we're talking about. Some were handled more clumsily than others, because when you're right in the middle of it, you have no sense of historical context. Mm. Um, and uh, there was also an attempt sort of to capture this feeling of post-traumatic stress the entire country had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and That's why United 93 is a brilliant movie. I don't think I will ever watch again. Because uh, yeah, it's yeah. just the, one of the most stressful so, viewing experiences <laughs> you'll ever see. It's brilliant, mm. and it is harrowing in like the best and worst possible mm. ways. But you're right. So this but is this is more this, like an old John Wayne movie. This feels like a yeah. World War II movie where the good guys are clear, the bad guys are. In fact, the bad guys are all uniformly dressed in black cloaks. Yeah, the good guys are all these like handsome soldiers played well, by uh, Chris Hemsworth and Michael Pena and all these like um, really kind of boldly heroic looking figures. Yeah. And, they all have the cleanest teeth of anyone in the desert. Yeah, they're, uh, <laughs> they're just they're, brightly shining. You when they the, get when they get dirty, it's very aesthetically pleasing. Like their hair is a little tousled and they have a little smudge on their cheek. But they have the brightest smile. Like it'd be in a Crest and commercial, right? They now. have a very clear goal. They have very clear relationships, and once they accomplish that goal, it is considered a just the movie. Ends. There's no there's no ambiguity. It is a heroic thing they did. Yeah. The the event itself, just so mm. we're clear, it is based on a true story. Uh, right after 9-11. Uh, the first American uh, uh, military operation in Afghanistan uh, was to go behind enemy lines, team up with an Uzbek militia, and t- and uh, with them attack a Taliban stronghold. Now, this was considered to be an incredibly fortified Taliban stronghold. Probably wasn't going to fall for well, years was the idea. And-, and they managed to do it. This is a true story. This isn't a spoiler. It's pretty obvious from the get-go. They managed to do it. In three weeks. Mm. That's really impressive. Like, it's an impressive <laughs> military accomplishment. And, uh, I'll give you that. But they did, the movie there was, treats it like, and then we won that war. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it feels like the guns of Navarone. You know, it's like, and we get rid of those guns and everything's okay. So it's like, they get they got on horseback because there's no technology. And the, the struggles are all very, very clear and very Hollywood and very broadly broadcast. In such a way that it's kind of satisfying to watch. I've seen so many war films that are so bogged down in <clears throat> the smoke and the grit and you know the mm-hmm. <clears throat> the hurt locker moral compromises that are going on that it's strangely not strangely just weirdly refreshing to see it presented in su- with such cinematic clarity. I'm conflicted by that. And I, well, I'm conflicted by that. So it's boldly entertaining, and it's really, really watchable. It's, it's well produced, that's and for certain. It's reducing something that was really complex and really morally muddied with a type of filmmaking that is actually very morally clear and forthright. So mm. while I'm being boldly entertained by this movie, in the back of my head I'm thinking... It wasn't that clear. No, <laughs> this is really, really kind of irresponsible storytelling. Uh, that's even though it's really, really entertaining. Yeah, it's 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 well produced. But the question mm. you, you have to ask yourself is: Are we really? Is is it responsible? Mm. Uh, I was watching this movie, and one of the things they have in this movie one of the one of the visual sort of the reasons to make this particular war story over others visually is because uh, the entire group of American soldiers had to ride on horseback. Mm. And only, like, one of them had had any proper and, horse training. The, the book that this is based on was called Horse Soldiers. Yeah. Uh, and just, I, I realized, that I'm stupid for not putting this together earlier, but once I saw Chris Hemsworth riding into a battle on horseback, waving an M16 around or whatever mm. kind of weapon he had, I'm like, how did I put this together earlier? Like, this entire breed of post 9-11 modern war movies mm. the ones that are jingoistic or propagandistic your 13 hours for example yeah uh to a lesser extent uh something like lone survivor which has some moral complexity to it or certainly american sniper mm. 
these aren't really war movies. You describe them as World War II movies, and you're right, but what they really are is pre-revisionist westerns. <laughs> they are heroes in the white hat, bad guys in the black hat, American exceptionalism, hooray for Manifest Destiny, cavalry charge at the mm. end, going to the Liter- indigenous people. Literally pe- on horseback this time. The indigenous people are, are being sort of shoved aside, and thank goodness, because mm. American exceptionalism. <laughs> and you're watching that, and, like, and it's dramatically <clears throat> satisfying because it is morally simplistic. Yeah. Because it is narratively simplistic. So it's a satisfying watch. But in the back of your head, you should be thinking, mm. and there's a lot of little things that look, sort of key. Look, this wasn't so long ago no. that we have forgotten about the moral complexity I and know. the ugliness of this conflict. But here's the thing, though. There's a lot of... Like, could you imagine if they did something like this for the Vietnam War? They did. It was called the Green Beret, and people rejected it. Uh, there was also one called... Um, uh, once, once we're soldiers, we were soldiers. We were soldiers once. We were so, or once we're soldiers. No, once we're soldiers is a different. Uh, you're thinking of once we're warriors. Yeah. We were soldiers. The was Mel Gibson, a Mel Gibson film movie. about about the Vietnam yeah. War, and it, and it mm. really tried to oorah up the Vietnam War. Nobody remembers. Even I couldn't remember the title. Yeah. So, but that was we, but that was about Vietnam. We, but yeah, we know we know enough about Vietnam, the, and even now we know enough about Vietnam that we can't have that sort of bold, jingoistic approach toward that war. Vietnam was a very different war, though. Mm. Compared to the the wars that we're seeing in mm. films like this, or 13 Hours, or Lone Survivor, mm. are uh, more akin to World War II because there's a more of a volunteer soldier force. Okay. Vietnam was more about the, 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 draft. the was about the draft. People who didn't want to go to war. People who didn't understand why we were at war over mm. there. Uh, you don't see a lot of uh, wars, uh, movies about the Korean War for similar reasons. <laughs> a lot of Americans are just like, why were we there again? What did we have to do? Like, it's not as clear cut. We were attacked in World War in World War II, mm. and on top of it, when, when once people finally knew the extent of the atrocities the Nazis were committing, mm. people were like, well, then we were moral on both sides. <laughs> right. We were attacked in 9-11. Mm. There's a lot of complexity to that, but the long and short of it is we were attacked and we responded. Mm. Okay. Everyone kind of understood that. A lot of people signed up to go to war for that reason. There is a clear moral imperative. Mm. And on top of that, this war and its sort of adjuncts Mm. has been going on now for the better part, or the larger part anyway, of two decades. Yeah. And as a result, people have been living with this war and living with people that they know at, in this war, mm. people know soldiers. I'm come from I'm come from a military family. My brother was out of it before mm. that happened, but like you know, I know people who are in military families. You want to see people you know and care about and love and hope come home safely, mm. treated respectfully, yeah, and even heroically. There's a total market for that in in a movie. And mm. when you make a whole bunch of movies about how the war sucks, it's easy to sort of go, "Hey, fuck you." That's my brother is over there. Yeah. You know, like, I, I totally get that. But at the same time, there's a difference between sort of catering to a mindset and making good drama. 12 Rounds caters to a demographic 12, 12, that wants... 12 Strong. 12, 12 <laughs> Rounds is an okay movie, by the way. It's like it's like Die Hard with a Vengeance, but with Michael... Is it Sena? John Sena. John, John Sena. Sena's in it. Yeah. I said Michael... Also, Sarah, but okay. Also, I think you're thinking of 16 Blocks. I No, 16 Blocks with Bruce Willis and Most Deaf. Oh shoot! That's also oh. not bad. That's also not a bad movie. Twelve rounds is. Uh, uh, well, we're talking about is, twelve strong. We're talking about twelve strong. Uh, twelve strong is a is a well produced. Mm. It's incredibly well produced. Well produced. This, this well is made. like, sure this is well like Ron Howard Spielberg ish. Well, kind of I, think it, I don't think it, it hits on that kind of mm. sincere emotional level, but certainly it's well made. Mm. Um, there's, but yeah, I, I don't think it's good drama, and I don't think it's necessarily a responsible way to look at the conflict. Mm. However, if that's your demo. You're probably gonna like it. There's a lot yeah. to like about it. The action's really great. Mm. This is one fucking like, moment. Like I said, it's boldly entertaining. Yeah, it's easy to watch. This it's, is great. It go, goes down smooth. This is great fucking moment that I just I, I laughed so hard. I know I shouldn't have, but it was just mm. so perfectly handled. Where uh, uh, Chris Hemsworth is like on the battlefield, and like there was an explosion near him, and he got knocked mm. off his horse, and the horse is on the ground next to him. Mm. And they did that Saving Private Ryan moment where the ears are ringing, and you're like, mm. oh, uh, war. Oh. And then finally <laughs> something happens, and they snap out of it, and he gets up, and he's like, goes prone, and like mm. he has his weapon in hand. And then and with a great musical cue, the horse gets up immediately. <laughs> ah, my master needs me! I am a noble steed! And the horse pulls out a gun and sl- Salutes Chris Hemsworth. It might as well have. Like, right. that's the level of, of just hero worship this has. 
I get it. I don't think it's particularly well produced drama, but it's certainly well made for that particular mm-hmm. context. Um, tell, tell me about uh, Mary and the Witch's Mary Flower. and the Witch's Flower. Mary and the Witch's Flower is the latest film from director Hiromasa Yonobayashi. If you don't know that Previously name. Previously of the Ghibli school, yes? Yes. He made two films for Studio Ghibli, two great films for Studio Ghibli. Uh, he made The Secret World of Arietti, mm-hmm. uh, which was based off of a British fantasy book called The Borrowers. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also made a movie, uh, movie called When Marnie Was There, which is based on, I think, a book of the same title. Mm-hmm. Um which is also a British fantasy book about a, a young introverted woman who befriends someone who may be uh, uh, in an abusive household or may be a mm-hmm. ghost. Um, I'm not going to ruin that movie for you. It's really fantastic. Um, um, you, you liked when Marnie was there? I really liked it, actually. Uh, I think it has some plot problems at the end where it just kind of refuses to end. But by that point, I was so emotionally invested, I didn't care. Um, but it, it, it doesn't resolve that movie. It, I think it, does. it was one of the times G- Ghibli sort of disappointed me. No, I think it resolves because I think it resolves the character because it's about someone who feels unloved and who is unable to connect to others mm. because she is an introvert. There aren't enough movies mm. celebrating introversion. I find there are too many films in which the hero finally achieves happiness when they stop being an introvert. And it's like, mm. it's okay to be an introvert. And I think that's mm. a movie about it being okay to be quiet. And reserved, and only have one friend, yeah. and how that there's a certain level of enormous importance of that emotional connection. I, th- I love that movie. I, I feel think- like I feel like it started to head down a certain direction, and then just sort of like stopped, and kind of started I, wandering for a little I, bit. I think the last like ten minutes, there are like too many reveals. Yeah. I don't think we needed all of it. I think it just gets a little lost, mm-hmm. but I do think it works. Regardless, I think he's a great filmmaker when it mm-hmm. comes to sort of youthful melancholy and matching that with a certain fantastical element and certainly his films are gorgeously animated mm-hmm. um, so this is his first film outside of Studio Ghibli which has pretty much closed up shop they have some other projects but they're not really making movies right now it is another adaptation of a British fantasy book I believe the book is called The Little Broomstick um, and it is about a young girl in the English countryside she is there. Uh, she's going to start school in like a week. Her parents are moving in a little bit later. So she's staying with her great aunt. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's all she's bored, basically. Nothing to do in the countryside. She keeps wanting to do things, but she's young and she's over eager and she's clumsy and she doesn't think things through. And so even if like she goes to the gardener and says, hey, yeah, I'm just sort of tying these flowers together so that they don't break. Mm-hmm. She immediately breaks one. Doesn't yeah. mean to. She's young and clumsy and mm-hmm. didn't think it through. So when she finds a magic flower in the woods that when, like, you crush the seeds up, like when you squish them, like Mm -hmm. a berry, uh, it gives you magical powers for a short time. She kind of jumps in with both feet. Yeah. She is immediately recruited to be part of a magic school. Like, oh, like, geez. Yeah, which is a little like, I've seen that. Uh. Um, And then it turns out there's a big conspiracy at the school or whatever like that. Um, The problem with this... I I think there was a series of films about conspiracies at a magic school. I've heard of something like that before. Where where have I seen that before? Oh, it was um, um, was Inkheart? Inkheart, that was it. Inkheart of the Spiderwick Chronicles, one of those. One of those. Yeah. Uh, Cirque du Freak, (laughs) if memory serves. Um, okay, let's let's. Okay, first off, I think if memory mm-hmm. serves, that the book this is based on predates Harry Potter. I'm sure, and it, so yeah. does the Worst Witch, which was also very Harry Potter. Mm. The idea of a magic school is not new. No, no, it's not. Uh, in fact, there's actually a really brilliant anime series that's on Netflix right now. You can watch called Little Witch Academia, which is basically an all girls Harry Potter academy. With the most amazing action animation and some really <laughs> clever writing. It's really funny and emotional. It's mm. great. Mm. And it's better than Marrying the Witch's Flower. And the reason why. <laughs> the reason why is because although this movie is gorgeously animated, and if you love anime and if you can see it in a the theater, it's still worth it. Mm. But it falls short because the emotional core of the protagonist is really not very well defined. Mm. She's bored. She jumps into everything with both feet. But the journey she goes on, all of her problems are caused by, like, overzealously running into things. And all of them are solved by overzealously running into things. There's no arc. There's she's nothing. She's not learning anything. She's not learning anything. And as a result, it feels like kind of a really flimsy coming of age story. So all we've really got is the a plot. Girl, a girl gets out of jams. Yeah. And all we've, so all we've got is the plot. That can be okay. Mm. It's, a little, it's a little hollow. But the problem is the plot is really kind of familiar. Mm. And... There are some things they do differently. There's a whole sequence with, like, transmogrified animals, like a menagerie mm. of transmogrified animals that have all been, like, had magical things done to them. And it's it's kind of like that scene in, like, The Rescuers Down Under where all the animals are <laughs> in the cages. Yeah. But they're all, like, these fantastical creatures that you've never seen before. And it's a hell of an image. Okay. And I'm glad I saw the big screen. 
totally amazing image, gorgeous animation. But I, it, I'm not going to carry it with me mm. the way I did Arietti or when Marnie was there or even mm. any of the other Studio Ghibli films. Uh, just because it's kind of just all about the incident. Mm. And the emotional core of it kind of falls flat because the more you find out about the backstories and who this person was and who this person was and this old person was young and did this and blah, it doesn't really come together very well and it doesn't feel terribly important mm. when all is said and done. It just yeah. feels like a bunch of plot happening. And that's disappointing. It's still the best film opening this weekend, I would say. <laughs> but it is a bit of a step uh, down. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, a lot of... Uh, um you know, Studio Ghibli is one of the few anime studios that kind of reached as big a crowd as it did. I mean, they're 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 the Japanese Pixar, yeah. To, as far as and, most people are concerned, uh, except they never I, made shitty movies. <laughs> well, here's the thing: they do mm. not not t- terrible movies, but they mm. make films that are under snuff. That we don't really see widely in America, and it's because they're under... Like, I, Tales from Earthsea, for instance. Okay, I'm going to throw it right out there, though, uh, that they set themselves... A, a, if that was the best they'd ever done, we'd still be pretty impressed by it. The problem is that mm. they've also done Spirited Away. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, there, but also, a lot of the films that... Earthsea was a good example to bring up, because mm. it's based off of Western material, mm. and it just doesn't translate very well. Uh, but like, there's a lot of the material that like comes over here, and people are kind of confused by. There's just a cultural divide. Yeah. You ever watch Palm Poco? Which is yeah, about, which is about, I was, was going to bring up Palm Poco. Yeah, which is a really, really good movie, but it's a, it got some really bizarre cultural markers. Mm. Part and, of it and is, the tone is all over the place. Tone is all over movie. the place. It's it's a story about uh, uh, basically tanukis or raccoons mm. um, who are uh, human beings are encroaching onto their forest and building cities, and they decide to fight back. And it turns out they're shapeshifters. Yes, but not all of them; just their scrotums. Just their testicles. That's an actual thing. Uh, now, yeah. that's a cultural thing. That's not, that's not quite as weird over there. You watch it in America, you're just like, yeah, I can see why this didn't get a big theatrical release. <laughs> it's it's not really a, weird. Very few kid animated films in America that are very testicle-centric. Yeah. I can think of maybe four or five. <laughs> <laughs> it's very strange. It's a strange movie. It doesn't... And, and, and although the actual storyline mm. about sort of the encroaching Western world basically is a... Certainly, a, a sentiment mm. that is understood. But again, that's, in Japan, that's it's culturally salient and not it, necessarily translating to. It, America. Yeah, oh, here it's not going to strike. The, you can get it, but you're not. It's not going to strike the same chord. Mm. Um, so, like some of like the Studio Ghibli films, we don't celebrate as often over here. There's just a cultural divide. Mm. Some of them also aren't particularly good, but that's okay. Mm. Um, yeah, this is this would be very very low on the Studio Ghibli totem pole. Mm. This is not a Studio Ghibli film, though. This is a oh, film okay. by a Studio Ghibli mm. uh, um, acolyte. Yeah. Uh, graduate alumnus, whatever you want to call it, um, and it's it's okay. Like mm-hmm. I've, I've God knows I've seen worse anime movies, fantasy movies, um, but it's not really like coming out swinging. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you love anime and if you love like fantasy films, you want to take a you want a good film that you can take a kid to see. It's good. Yeah. This is a good movie. You should oh, see yeah. it. It's just I'm pro- I'm not going to go nuts raving about it just because it really doesn't well, connect very hard. The Secret World of Arietti from the same director um, is. Visually innovative, mm-hmm. but I feel like that's also a story I've seen before because it's based on a British book that you uh, may have read. That, well, I haven't read it, but I've seen the Borrowers and I've seen the Littles, so mm. I, I've seen the other adaptations first. Is the Littles so officially the Borrowers? I thought it was just a ripoff. It's a ripoff of the Borrowers, yeah. really. The, the, the they're other, more like elf creatures, whereas the Borrowers are just small people. The live action Borrowers with John Goodman is actually mm. a pretty good movie. It's a pretty good movie. Yeah, I like that movie. Mm. It's, it's got a weird aesthetic that feels very nineties, but it's mm. still well made. Like, well, like early two thousands. It, it was around the same time as Mouse Hunt. That was like nineties. That was like nineties. Like, yeah, Mouse, so. Mouse Hunt was like the second DreamWorks movie. So that was like nineties. Yeah, um, and and when Marnie was there, yeah, I, I'm maybe I'm on the losing side of history on this one, but I think it's just sort of a forgettable film. I, I did not forget it. It really hit me pretty close. All right. Um, so I love that movie. Um, let's uh, let's go through our ratings. So, okay. Um, what did um, you think of Witch's Flower? Uh, you know, I'm going to give it on a scale of C minus C plus. A high C. Okay. It, it's, it's pretty good, but I'm not going to tell you to run out and see it unless it already sounds like you're back. All right. All right. Uh, uh, so uh, tw- twelve, twelve strong. I'm going to give a C because it's just good, solid filmmaking, and I w- I was too too entertained to really be bothered by the complexity that it's clearly like going out of its way to ignore. Yeah, it I, doesn't I, feel irresponsible. It feels like just some sort of bold, entertaining Hollywood product, mm-hmm. and that was it. That could be enough on a certain night. So. I, I can't get over how irresponsible it is, but it's not badly made. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt about um, Thirteen Hours, 
mm-hmm. which I think is actually arguably Michael Bay's best film. Oh, it's definitely Michael Bay's best film. Because uh, un- un- uh, politically, it's actually somewhat irresponsible. As a siege picture, it's mm. qu- very thrilling. It's yeah, very well yeah, produced. Yeah. And you can't entirely take that away because it's also not, it's not really evil. It's just kind of one-sided. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'll, give it, I'll give it another C as well. And forever, my girl. You know... <laughs> I want to say this. Just say C minus and get it over with. It's it, fine. it was the most. I was. I was more entertained oh. in a weird way than well, by any I, other I movie. Think, I think just we had a good we, time watching well, it. I mean, we were mouthing off at this movie. It's just but it's so, an entertaining yeah. watch. There was. We were at a theater. There was like a bunch of like uh, uh, young women mm. who showed up in pajamas. Yeah. To watch the movie is like a slumber. It was like an outdoor slumber party, and they were they were like taking pictures of the screen with their phones, and they were chatting amongst themselves. Normally, I'd and, be yeah. furious, but this is the kind this of movie kind where of I'm movie. like, you know, it's what? Like, fine, this is fine. Just <laughs> not, it's fine. Do it your gave thing. us license to be a little smart alecky too. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a C minus, but it's an entertaining C minus. Oh, what did what I say that really made you laugh? Oh, you you described Alex Rowe as one of those play sets where like the head opens up and it's an action. That's right. <laughs> it's got a like this big round handsome head, and it looks like you open it up and like Mighty Max and the Pirate Lord live inside. <laughs> that that was it was made me laugh. <laughs> made me laugh. Hey, anyway, let's get to our double feature. Okay, so our double feature this week was selected once again by our Schmoville mm-hmm. uh, fans. You go to the Schmoville. Uh, exclamation point Facebook page uh, every week we have a new poll mm. uh, this was actually kind of an aberration because we had a tie on our poll two yeah. weeks ago and we decided okay we'll do both we'll just one after the other mm-hmm. last week we did Dirty Dancing Havana Nights with the incredible Brienne Chandler mm. uh, and you should totally listen to that episode if you haven't already because she is wonderful uh, and this week we're reviewing a movie that for a while there uh-huh. was kind of was universally it? considered one of the worst movies ever made. Mm. And then what happened was it stopped being on TV. People stopped watching it. It wasn't like available on home video very easily for a while. And people just kind of forgot how bad it was. And people were just like, oh, yeah, Orca. I heard of that Jaws knockoff. I've seen a lot of Jaws knockoffs. How bad could it be? I haven't seen it. I'm just going to assume it's just one of those kind of lame Jaws knockoffs. And let me tell you something. I hadn't seen Orca since I was like eight years old. Uh huh. I rewatched you it. You saw it on TV. Oh I'm yeah, sure. I saw it on yeah. TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It played, it played on Channel Thirteen a lot here in LA. <laughs> yeah, Channel Thirteen was the uh, weekend syndicated movie channel yeah, where yeah. you just you would see like a PG thirteen cut version of RoboCop and then Ghostbusters back to back a lot. But then they would throw in Orca. Well, they they had theme weeks. Oh, that's what uh, they channel, did. I forgot. Yeah, uh, and they had like this is going to be Creature Feature Week, and it's yeah. all alligators, and then we have like creepy crawly week and it's all like bugs and slugs yeah what, what i remember was all horror mil- movies and they called it not for the week week <laughs> okay that's pretty good actually no uh, it's not it's terrible that's, oh, fuck you, that's funny okay so orca uh-huh. uh i rewatched it for the first time in like mm-hmm. over 20 years oh uh-huh. almost 20 years uh this is one of the worst movies ever made it, it well on, you gotta judge on a scale though the premise is one of the dumbest ever made. The, well, the idea they came up with for this Jaws knockoff was Jaws the Revenge before Jaws the Revenge had been made and <laughs> kind of dragged that series down with it. Yeah. This came out in 1977. Mm-hmm. The same year as Star Wars. That's right. And it's a Jaws knockoff, but orcas in the world of orca mm-hmm. are way more badass than great white sharks. Yeah, this is, this is in Free Willy if Free Willy was evil. It opens with a shark stalking through the waters and an orca kicks its fucking ass. <laughs> Yeah, so like the open. Okay, okay, okay. So just, just, just. I, I want to clarify one quick thing before we go any further. When I say this is one of the worst movies ever made, there are different kinds of worst movies ever made. Ah. Uh, there are. We made this for two thousand dollars, and it is the, cheap, and it is a, the is, filmmaking is so like the money yeah. was so low, and the yeah. the filmmakers so rushed that it doesn't matter how talented they were, they they couldn't put together a, a cogent film. So that's the room. That's mm. Birdemic. You've no, seen that. well, that's that's outsider cinema. I think that's no, a different but, category. Okay, but my okay, but the point is you've seen like the super cheap, really lame ones. Yeah. That you talk about like when you do the list of the worst movies ever made. Mm. Then there are we had money. We had money, we had time, we had talented people, really talented people. Mm. Good like, cast. super great super cast fucking talented movie. people. Mm. And we made this. Yep. So we every decision that we made that was fucking stupid. We thought was a good idea at the and time. <laughs> other, and we ran it by other people, and they said, sure. Oh. This is like the Batman and Robin of its time. Just every decision <laughs> is just like, why would you go with that yeah. over literally anything else you could do? So we open with a montage of orcas being awesome. Just cute, 
Uh-huh. Playing, and it's cute. And then we cut to Richard Harris, one of the greatest actors who ever lived. And a uh, notorious raconteur. Yes. Uh, you can look, he, he has passed now, but you can look up the wonderful stories he has of, of him and Peter O'Toole yeah. doing some of like the most depraved things when they're drunk. Yeah, because one of the great <laughs> drunks in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Um, just- there, there's a, uh, he tells a really great story. He and Peter O'Toole, I think they were doing a production of Beckett or some like really classy play, and they hated the production. They thought that the director was awful, the whole production was awful. They, they, that rendition of the play, they were just not having a good time. So they would get through it by drinking. Ah, yes. Backstage, on on stage, off stage, doesn't matter. They're just going to drink through this whole production. And they, he tells a story of how they went out on the first act, and it was just not going well. So during intermission, they ran across the street to the bar in costume and just started slamming back shots so they could get through the second act. And they realized that they were drinking for so long that they were going to miss their cue. <laughs> Like, the lights were going down across the street. They're like, oh, crap, we're drinking. We're so drunk. And they run across the, uh, across the street. They run into the theater. They run out onto stage. They have missed their cue already. So they run out onto stage. <laughs> Richard Harris is so drunk, he's running out onto stage that he trips over the footlights and lands in the front row of the theater. And he lands in this old woman's lap. And she looks down at Richard Harris and says, oh, God, Harris is drunk. In front of, in front of the entire theater. And Harris, not missing a beat, looks right up at her and says, If you see me, you wait till you see O'Toole! <laughs> Such a great story. Okay, so, Richard Harris. Uh, <laughs> great actor, great drunk. <laughs> great drunk. Certainly uh, certainly an accomplished drunk. Mm. Um, he plays a fisherman. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning of the movie, he is trying to capture a great white shark. He is mortgaged to the hilt, and he's just trying to make money, and people pay money for sharks nowadays. Because, so, probably because of Jaws. So there you go. This movie takes place in a world where Jaws exists. So what we got here is uh, uh, we've got Peter O'Toole, mm-hmm. Bo Derek before she was anybody. Uh-huh. The, who, the great Bo Derek. Or who, the, who sits for most of the role because her leg is injured. Yeah, she's, she, her, she breaks her leg in like her fourth scene and then she's yeah. on a bed the most of the film. Yeah. Uh, and her fa- fa- Famous model sex symbol Bo Derek. Yeah. Uh, and her boyfriend uh, Peter Hooten, who was mm-hmm. the first live action Doctor Strange. <laughs> That's all I've seen him in. D. Putin. D. Putin. It's an in joke for our cancel too soon fans. Ch- charming, charming guy for the 1970s. Yeah, when, when feathered hair and mustaches could could get you anywhere. And uh, the ubiquitous Keenan Wynn. Yes, one of the one of the character actors who, if you watch enough movies from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you will get to know Keenan Wynn very well. He was in the absent minded. He was the bad guy in the absent minded professor. Sure, he uh, was the soldier who shot out the coke machine in Dr. Strangelove. You've yep. seen him around. Yeah, Keenan Wynn is one of the great ubiquitous character actors. So they're off to catch a, a, a shark. Mm. They run into Charlotte Rampling. <laughs> Another amazing actress who's been in a lot of garbage movies. She sure has, but she, she's always amazing. She's always amazing. Yeah, and, uh, and her assistant, Robert Carradine, who would go on to star in Revenge of the Nerds. Oh, and not recognizable. I would not like. I, I didn't recognize him until the second half of the movie. Okay, like when all of a sudden there was a close up. I'm like, hey, oh, it's, it's the guy from Revenge of the Nerds. So they are about to be like, there's a there's a great white shark mm. careening towards them at like rocket speeds, and then a killer whale comes in from the side and rams it. <laughs> yep, like punches it in the stomach with its nose, now, just it, to show it's so much more badass than killer whale than the than sharks. It's it's. Established in this film a little bit later that they are very intelligent, these creatures, and that they have emotional connections to the whales around them, which means this was a conscious decision by this killer whale to kick the ass of the shark. Well, right after this, right after this bit, is there a prequel to Orca where we learn what beef the killer whale had with the shark? (laughs) I hope so. I was watching this with my wife, Michelle, and uh, she had a couple of great lines I'm going to quote for you. (laughs) One of which was, it's a shame this didn't make more money so we could could have a sequel called Morcas. Oh, God. And I was like, yes! (laughs) After this scene, or like around this scene, we cut to Charlotte Rampling, who like works, she's like an oceanographer or Mm. or a marine biologist, and uh, she's giving a a huge lecture about white orcas. exposition, I mean, about orcas. Just basically every piece of information they could find about orcas 
that make them seem more badass than sharks. Yeah, like everything, like oh yes, orca. It's Latin for bringer of death. And look, look at look at the close up of these teeth. Uh, okay, actually, they're they're kind of round and not as badass as shark teeth. But look at these teeth. Yeah, and we got Charlotte. Ram- and Charlotte Rampling has this great British mm. voice where just, everything she says mm. sounds super meaningful and important. And she says, and this line, like when she says it, you're like, oh wow, that sounds really fucked up. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> like human beings, they have a profound instinct for vengeance. She sells it. She yeah. sells the heck out of that line. The idea is that if you if you fuck up a killer whale, it will remember you for life. And that's the plot of the movie. Richard Harris, Richard Harris <laughs> decides to get in the spe- <laughs> spears it in the fin because he can get more money for that orca. Okay, well, here's the deal. He didn't know about killer whales until that opening scene of the movie, mm. and Charlotte Rampling has to explain them to him. He's like a 60-year-old fisherman. Uh-huh. And a, a, wh- a, never, whale, a whaler and shark hunter. Yeah, yeah. He has never fucking heard of them. He doesn't know a damn thing about them. <laughs> he just knows that they're worth a lot of money. So he decides to capture one. Mm-hmm. And Charlie Rampling's like, you're just going to, you're not going to capture one. You're going to fucking kill him by accident. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, nah. And yeah. then he does. Uh-huh. So he goes into this like school of orca. He harpoons a, a one of the family of orca. That's right. He goes, or a pod, I guess is what it would be. Uh, He harpoons one in the fin, Mm. but then he ends up actually, like, harpooning, like, really wounding Mm. the female. Yeah. And then the female gets so freaked out, she decides to commit suicide by running into the propeller of his boat. And then he pulls the orca up on a chain, and and then... (laughs) And then it's so badly, its body is rent, and a... And a, a little baby. A baby a orca baby falls orca out. Fa- like this big, it's yeah. kind of gross, this and big we, wet thud. And we keep, and it, it looks like uh, 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 like the, the guy in the stomach in Total Recall. Like, yeah. it's just kind of human. And then, like, the, like Keenan Wynn just, like, chucks it overboard. Yeah. And then you keep cutting to the shot of the male whale who's, like, been wounded, like uh-huh. Captain Ahab. And he's looking at the close-up of his eyes, and he's, like, crying. The whale is crying. <laughs> and, like, just it's the most <laughs> fucked up thing ever. And then when they finally... And then, oh and then, and then it, it is so aggrieved, this poor whale, yes. that, that his wife and child have, have been, been murdered. murdered. And all fairness, and, and, she killed herself. Well, to, some... to protect him, he was injured. Okay. She was very brave. Okay. Pre- this pregnant woman all leapt right, in front what? of his way. You're right, I'm the asshole. Yeah. <laughs> right. and, and to show off what this evil human has done, he pushes the corpse okay. onto the beach. Okay. Look what you did, okay, but you're, Richard Harris. You're underselling it. <laughs> because what happens is he like he eats Keenan Wynn. Well, oh, okay. And then and then he eats Keenan Wynn. And by the way, Richard Harris, like he eats Keenan Wynn, and Richard Harris is staring and he's just like yeah, fair enough. <laughs> like, yeah, we started it. Yeah, yeah touche, I guess. And then, the, in order to appease the whale, they drop the corpse of his orca bride uh-huh. into the ocean. And then there's a long sequence of the whale pushing his dead wife mm. across a sunset horizon. <laughs> I'm watching this, and, and Michelle, what did she say? Like, they want orcas in the audience to get upset and take to the streets. <laughs> like, that's how, that's how, like, uh-huh. aggrieved this orca is. It's amazing. And he pushes the or- the dead orca to Richard Harris's house. He knows where he knows where, where knows where Richard Harris. And he sit- lives. He lives in a house that is like it's on stilts on a pier. It's over the water. Yeah, it's like a fishing community. So everyone lives mm. on the water or mm. near the pier. And he lives like literally over the water. And there's like a little there's like a little inlet, mm. like a Gilligan's an, Island an, type an, inlet an, right it's, by his house. Isthmus. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. And um, yeah, and they say like, oh, he must have followed you home. We literally saw that he didn't do that. He just went off another direction and came back and shoved the corpse onto your house saying and he's just calling him out like fucking Brendan Fraser in school ties just like <laughs> on the beach and he starts like punching holes in all the other boats and then we have oh god what's the name of the actor was it Will Sampson yeah, Will oh. Sampson. He plays Umalak. Will Sampson uh, oh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest mm. as the guy who wouldn't talk. Yeah, he played, Ch- I think they called him Chief. Chief. Yeah, he played Chief. He plays, He plays. let's be honest here, the Native American stereotype. Very, very He knows all the old yeah. legends, and mm-hmm. he just tells them, like, oh, yeah. Yeah, he done pissed off that orca. He's calling you out. You got to go out <laughs> and fight the orca to death. I wish they'd put it out there. It's like, what is going on here? Well, you done pissed off that orca. He's calling you out. He's call, calling you out. You, you got to fight that fucker. And Richard Harris is just sort of, he's trying to like brush it off. He's just like, what, what's it going to do? No. And then the orca mm-hmm. blows up a power plant. <laughs> 
<laughs> now it's wearing a cat suit and it sneaks in with some wire cutters. The orca. And then it slips out of its cat suit and has a tuxedo underneath and the, it dances with his wife. The orca busts a pipeline and then it busts the foundation of a building. And I guess the orca knew that there was an old tiny lantern on in the middle of a table. I don't know how it knew that. It busts open. The lantern falls into the stream of oil. The um, oil goes up the oil pipeline and blows up a giant power plant in the horizon now <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> and then the orca does a triumphant leap through the air like free willy in the, the foreground as it's blowing up in the background like ha ha motherfuckers <laughs> <laughs> which is hard to get threatened by because i've seen you know we've seen orcas do that at like sea world and stuff and it's yeah. like oh how cute <laughs> as the human human flesh burns this is not played for laughs like in something like deep blue sea where yeah. a shark turns on an oven yeah they, where they know it's ridiculous yeah, they're treating this this really is seriously really really serious and it's that tone of seriousness paired with the absolute absurdity that an orca just burned down a building <laughs> that, that makes that wasn't this even film on the bad shore. yeah like and now like, here's the thing now they know that an orca is after their family. Now, Richard Jenny has a really... Stand-up comedian Richard Jenny has a really great bit about Jaws the Revenge. Have you heard it? No, I think you heard that one. Where uh, Jaws the Revenge is equally bad, and it, it's yeah. about a shark that's trying to get revenge. And you know, this, yeah. this shark kills a bunch of members of this woman's family as revenge. And, like, tracks and, them across the world. Oh, yeah, and, and it's like... They go to the Caribbean to get away from it, and, and it and Richard, them. And Richard Jenny's bit, he's like, well, she... She comes to the conclusion, well, obviously a shark is after my family. There's only one solution. We're leaving town. And Richard Jenny says, well, leaving town? Isn't that a pretty severe diversionary maneuver to avoid a fish? (laughs) And just not go in the water. Wouldn't that make much more sense? Even if you have a really ambitious shark. (laughs) By the time it gets out of the water, rents a car, gets to your place, goes up the elevator and gets down to your building, you would smell fish and split. (laughs) Okay, so we're we're, we're on... Okay, Again, every single thing we're telling you about Orca is mm. underselling Orca. Because what we haven't really gotten into yet is the idea that Richard Harris feels really bad about this. Mm. Because we find out that Richard Harris's family was killed by a drunk driver. And unlike the Orca, he did not go off on a mission of revenge. So we have multiple scenes of Richard Harris, like, drunkenly weeping because an Orca loved his family more, more than, than he, than loved, he loved, his loved his own, own family. Because he didn't go on a vengeance spree. Holy shit! I, I just, I wish there had been, like, the Ahab moment where he's on the back of the whale and they're just sort of staring <laughs> each other down. Uh, this is essentially a Moby Dick story. Yes. But species flipped. And yeah, if where you Ahab come, is the whale. If you had come at me with, it's a species flipped Moby Dick, I'm like, you know what? Sold. Here's your check. You make that movie. Oh, wait. It's Orca. <laughs> <laughs> so it all, so what happens is the Orca finally, like, Gets mm-hmm. real pissed off and decides, well, fuck it, I'm just going straight to Richard Harris's house. I'm gonna, no, again, why? He knows it's after his family. Get out of the house that's over the water. <laughs> yeah. Like, one of the first, the first thing people say is you should get out of town. Everyone's just like, yeah, this orca's mm-hmm. being weird. We think it's your fault. You We're being superstitious. Of, you don't have to get out of town. Him. Move 100 feet inland. Yeah, but the first thing people do in the town is try to drive them away. Yeah. And, by, and, then, and now, like, there's structural damage, a power plant's blown up, and people won't let him leave now. He sends Peter Hooten out to gas up the truck Mm -hmm. so they can all just leave. Fuck it, we're going inland, who gives a shit anymore? It's not worth it. And then they won't sell him gas because they're trying to force him to fight the whale. (laughs) You need to go out and fight that whale on its own terms. Like, what? So finally he gets in the boat. Oh, sorry. The orca, like, busts up his house. Bo Derek is dangling from the house over the orca. The orca eats her broken leg. Which is insult to injury, really. Right? At least it wasn't the, the healed leg. I, I suppose not, where she just has one broken leg. The problem, of course, is that if the orca eats her good leg, she can't even be mad at the orca. She doesn't have a leg to stand on. So... We- I'm not gonna stab you. I'm not gonna stab you. I'm not gonna stab you right now. I'm proud of myself. There's a dagger right there. So, so... Richard Harris, uh. Peter Hooten, Robert Carradine, and Charlotte Rambling for no particularly good reason. She, get on a boat. They, pay, they paid her salary. Why not? Yeah. And, like, she has great speeches, too, about, like, because after a while, Richard Harris is like, you know what? The orca's mm. right. I'm just going to, like, I'm just going to fucking kill myself. I'm just going to, like, that's what he wants. Uh-huh. And then she's just like, okay, here's the deal. If you knew someone who was grieving over the death of their family and they started behaving in self-destructive ways, would you give them everything they wanted? Mm. And he's like, well, no. Then why would you give a whale everything <laughs> it wants? <laughs> he's just like, ah, shit, I guess you're right. <laughs> it's a weird bit. 
So they go off to find the whale, and then after a while, the, they start chasing the whale around. The whale, I think, eats Robert Carradine, which is pretty funny because it saved mm. Robert Carradine from a shark in the first scene. <laughs> and uh, after a while, there's no sign of the whale, and they decide that the whale is intentionally trying to drive them insane. Mm. That's a plot point. The whale is trying to ignore them to death. They end up... <laughs> the whale gives them the silent treatment. <laughs> they end up... In, like, a glacier. It looks like... Oh, that, this all takes place in Canada. By oh, yeah, this yeah. all takes place in, like, Newfoundland. And yeah. They end up sailing all the way north. There's a huge glacier, the bank of glaciers. It looks like the old Hoth playset from, like, the 19, <laughs> early 1980s no, that my brother like, had. No, they shot on real glaciers. I know, Come but on, that doesn't look fake at all. It doesn't look fake, but that's what it looks like. It looks, like, too perfect. Like, they found, oh, really, right. almost, they found a set that was too good. <laughs> and they're just all surrounded by glaciers, and the killer whale says, fuck it, the time is now, and starts shoving glaciers into the boat. Yeah. He's trying to titanic them to death. Richard Harris is going to shoot him, and he realizes, no, I need to harpoon it for reasons. Because it's more Moby Dickish that way. And then, like, everyone get it? starts. Mo- Moby Dickish? I get it. Yeah. Everyone starts getting crushed by ice flows. <laughs> Richard Harris is, like, trying to shove the harpoon into the thing, and he's running across mm. glaciers, and it's the stupidest fucking thing ever. And, and, sw- and then the orca swats him with his tail. Yeah, the orca punches him, like, just slaps him across the face with his tail. It's so ridiculous. And then fucking Richard Harris gets eaten by the whale, and then the whale goes on. Under- this I had to have this explained to me. I looked this up. The idea is that the whale committed suicide at the end because uh, it like swam under the icebergs and never came out and oh, it drowned think, itself. I didn't think it committed suicide. I saw it like its bloody quest for vengeance brought it to a spot where it couldn't escape from, and that's what I thought. It was, too. Un, it was undone and it suffocated. I, I did some research, but that's what I thought too. Apparently, mm. the idea was the whale was just like I'm done. Fuck it, I'm out. Okay, that, like, that I, makes the movie stupid. Well, it's like, it's like, you know, they say in, like, revenge movies, you know, whenever I go off in revenge, you must mm. save two bullets, one for your enemy and one for yourself. And it's like the same thing, but with orcas. <laughs> save <laughs> one, one orca for your enemy one and your, one for yourself. One tail swat for your enemy. And then, so the it all ends with Charlotte Rampling. It's kind of like the end of Bridge on the River Kwai, like, what madness was this? And then a helicopter here in the background. He learned, so she'll probably be fine. He learned too late that man was a feeling creature. And then it ends with the worst song I've ever heard. <laughs> the, the love theme from Orca. Okay, so Ennio Morricone did the score to this. Ennio Morricone has composed some of the greatest motion picture scores mm. in history. Probably that- most iconically, the, uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Mm. <laughs> He did the he did music for a lot of Sergio Leone movies. He yeah. did the music for The Thing. He yeah. uh, most recently uh, did the music for The Hateful Eight. Won an Oscar for and it. Won an Oscar for it. Yeah. And uh, one of he, the few people to win an Oscar after they had already won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy. He's uh, also done uh, scores maybe the for one, maybe four hundred and fifty thousand other films, and he, a lot of them he did, did under pseudonyms, and they're just not credited. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> he just never stopped working, which yeah. means he's also done the music for a lot of garbage films, a lot as well, of garbage films. like Orca. And, and you know, here's the thing: the score for Orca is just kind of nondescript it's not mm-hmm. great but when you put a warble over it it's, it's just, like a debbie boone style fe- like really sappy well, female vocal it's sung by carol connors carol connors uh is probably best known uh for singing to know him is to love him oh okay. which is a great 1950s song yeah uh she also was nominated for an oscar for co-writing uh gonna fly now from rocky oh no kidding all right um and uh, she also wrote, if you're familiar with Mystery Science Theater 3000 and you've seen the episode Catalina Caper, she wrote one of the songs from Catalina Caper called wow. Book of Love. Not to be confused with the good version of Book of Love, oh. but specifically to be confused with the bad version of Book of Love, which it is. <laughs> but it's, she's, it sounds like she's doing a Florence Foster Jenkins impersonation. Like, it's really atonal, mm-hmm. amelodic. I the whales Everyone's a whale to me. You might be a whale. Vengeance. Vengeance. Love your your family like a whale. None of those are actual lyrics, but they might as well be for all all you can remember for because it's the least catchy song you've ever heard in your life. Orca needs to be rediscovered. Oh, God. People, because I remember... You and I are both old enough to remember when, like, the Golden Turkey Awards first came out. Oh, yeah. Right around the time. Mm. It was, like, like, it was like the early 80s, I think, that came out. It's, it's easy to forget in this time of internet irony that there was a long, 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 long time when bad art was just considered bad. <laughs> Not It wasn't rediscovered and celebrated and it, kept in the consciousness. It wasn't like so bad it's good. It, it was just 
pretty well, bad. And when a bad film like was out of the public eye, it was just gone. Yeah, like there was might, no interest anywhere. There it might was be bad. it might be like a box in a video store, but it mm. would only take a particular type of person or a particularly brave soul to bother to rent it and keep it in the consciousness yeah, it and would, keep it part of the conversation. It was fodder for late night monster features hosted mm. by people like Elvira mm. because it was cheap. No one gave a shit about these movies and it was used as a bit of a source of comedy. And then the Golden Turkey Awards was a book that came along. Mm. Uh, and it was all about incredibly bad movies. And it made the badness of these movies fascinating. Yeah, and a lot of these movies were still not available. I've still not seen a lot of the movies that were written about in the Golden Turkey Awards, but a lot of them would eventually become rather yeah, like, notorious and famous. Like Plan Nine from Outer Space yeah. was kind of, like the revival of Ed Wood happened with the Golden Turkeys. Yeah, and because yet, they declared they declared him the worst filmmaker of all time, and they were basically right. <laughs> but uh, but and that's that's true. That's a good mm. point, and it raised awareness of badness as sort of culturally uh, uh, significant uh, in and of itself. At the very least. A, a worthwhile pursuit. Yeah, it's worth seeing just how wrong-headed mm. these movies were. And Orca regularly made these lists. Yeah, there was, a, and that's one of the things I thought was interesting because I remember looking at their list of the worst movies ever made, and a lot of them were actually like people like voted mm. and they published a list. And this was like the popularity list, and film like Bland Nine from Outer Space was right up there. Uh, Orca was right up there. Another movie that has long since not been on home video, but is one of the worst movies ever made, but was a fresh wound at the time, The Oscar. <laughs> Which, I gotta tell you something, The Oscar is one of the worst movies ever. It is all about a guy who gets nominated for a Best Actor Oscar and decides to use every sneaky trick in his book to destroy all his competitors. <laughs> Everyone is in the movie. Like, literally it, everyone. It's, Milton it's, Berle is in the movie. Edith Head is in the movie. Joseph Cotton is in the movie. Jeez. The fucking, oh God, every fucking human being in the industry was can, in this movie can we put celebrating the, it. Like, this is going to be a big fucking deal. Can we have a future critically acclaimed poll where we have the Oscar and Sextet on the same list? Ooh. And, and maybe, like, Would anyone know what we maybe were like talking Maybe, like, Beyond about? the Poseidon Adventure. Like, some, one of those big... Can uh, we get Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, really? <laughs> Just one of those big, clunky 1970s disaster films with big cast yeah. of stars. Hang on. My point is, is that bad movies, when they're not talked about, they fade. Mm. Orca has faded. Thank you, Sergio. Sergio is a big, big fan of Orca. He likes that there are big fishes in them. He just likes to eat fish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fucking cat. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Orca, not talked about enough. I'm so glad we were able to raise its awareness. If you have not seen Orca mm. and you like bad movies, see Orca. Holy shit, Orca. <laughs> and of course, if it's, we make it popular enough, we can finally get our sequel. Morcas. Morcas. Moving on. I, I just call it like Orca Mania or something. For our double feature, the mm. good movie we're going to pair with Orca, we, the first thing we decided was we're not going to do Jaws. It's too oh, obvious. Yeah. We, we actually and, announced that last week. We're not going to do Jaws. It's too obvious. And you know you should see Jaws. Jaws is great. Mm. Jaws is a brilliant movie. It still holds up really well today. Um... We also toyed with the idea of doing Moby Dick, like the original the, version, the, 50, the John Houston version. The 53 which, version, yeah, yeah with um, Gregory Peck as Ahab. Written by Ray Bradbury, which is an interesting much picture, but again, it's a little on the nose. My my big suggestion to you was, what if we did Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan? Another re revenge story. Great yeah. revenge story that clearly evokes Moby Dick. Well, quotes Moby Dick. There you go. Um, but you really campaigned really, really hard <laughs> for an Australian horror movie that mm -hmm. is really kind of obscure. Yeah. It's a bit of a cult following, but isn't talked about very much, and I hadn't seen it. So I finally watched it. Mm. It's a fascinating motion picture. Why don't you take us into and explain why Orca is a great double feature with... Long Weekend. Okay, Long Weekend um, came out in 1978, the year after Orca. Right. And it, and it came was still out, in the post-Jaws, Animals it, Strike Back. Kinda, there, and this was, yeah, part know. of a huge wave of films that was going on at the time. There was Grizzly, there was mm -hmm. Day of the Animals, mm -hmm. there was Food of the Gods, there was fucking Night of the Lepus, which would probably <laughs> be on a I think Night of the Lepus future. was before Jaws, wasn't it? Was it? I don't know. I'm going to look, look that up. Look up Night of the Lepus. I feel like Night of the Lepus might have been its own weird entity. Okay, I feel like, like that was a post-Jaws film. But, and it's uh, worth noting before we, we go that besides Long Weekend, there are a lot of those post-Jaws movies that are quite good. Quite good. Like, Piranha is really mm, fun. Grizz uh, Grizzly's fine. Uh, 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 Alligator. Alligator. Alligator is yeah. great. <laughs> Alligator is a really good movie. Uh, a little later on, the, uh, Saul Bass made that one film, Phase 4, about the killer ants, which is just really out there. So long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Night of the Lepus was uh, in 1972. Oh, geez. So well before Jaws. 
then, then it's even weirder than yeah. I thought. Based on a 1964 uh, novel. Night of the Leafus, if you if you don't know what we're talking about, there's two kinds of people in the world, people who know what you're talking about, uh-huh. and people who need to see Night of the Leafus. <laughs> Night of the Leafus is about giant killer bunny rabbits. Bunny rabbits. A made, lot of them. Made by a lot of like old Western guys like... Stuart Whitman and Paul Fix and Janet Lee shows up. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh, 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 and like they growl and there's a lot mm. of shots like from the perspective of the giant bunny rabbits and they're like paws on like some like, like gigantic p- on a stick, stick or something they're just yeah. slashing at people as they're poking sticks at the and, camera and then they My cut to God, the, this movie and then you cut to the bunnies and you're like oh <laughs> little cute little bunnies the the, the anyway. tagline for night of the Leap, I'm gonna leave you with this All the right. tagline for night of the Leapus as they tried to pretend that it wasn't about rabbits how many eyes does horror have how many times will terror strike. How many fucking eyes? What the fuck are you talking about? They're rabbits. And, and in the preview, they don't show any rabbits. But yeah, it starts with this like really portentous narration. In the preview, you can look it up on YouTube. Yeah. What happened the night science made it, or what happened the night nature made its greatest mistake? <sighs> A bunch of bunnies charged in. Uh, but anyway, there was a, po- a wave after Jaws of a lot of killer monster creature features yeah like giant animal attack films and mm. piranha was like one of the clearest ripoffs joe dante's piranha yep and piranha 2 for that for yeah. that matter uh, james um, cameron's first film and this was also during a big wave of uh, australian exploitation movies that were just exploding throughout the 60s and 70s yeah, which would uh, peak with uh, mad max and the road warrior yeah. but there were a lot of them. there was patrick which was this mm. sort of exorcist uh, Damien the Omen knockoff, yeah, was, was really uh, cool. Uh, road Games, mm. Turkey Shoot, the, the filmography of Brian Trenchard Smith. You can <laughs> learn about a lot of these films from a really great documentary called Not Quite Hollywood, which is yeah. actually where I learned about uh, Long Weekend. Yeah, and, and if you're not familiar mm. with Ozploitation, particularly classic Ozploitation, it is a great treasure trove mm. of really interesting genre, mostly action, horror-type mm. thrillers, uh, with a lot... With a lot of personality, like a lot more personality okay. than you're used to from the era, they're really, really great. Mm. And Long uh, Weekend totally flew under my radar for a long time. Yeah, well, and I learned about it. I learned about it from Not Quite Hollywood. I watched it, and it's really, really astonishing because it feels almost like a Picnic at Hanging Rock or Walkabout. Mm. In it's this kind of depressive, angry contemplation on man's futility and their futile place in the natural world. It's very Werner Herzog, yeah. but it plays like a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it was directed by a guy named Colin Eggleston, and he has some really terrific credits. He did a lot of TV. He did some Doctor Who back in the day. Mm. Um, he did a movie called Phantasm Comes Again. <laughs> Uh, he, he did a, 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 a Not film to be confused called, with the Phantasm genre yeah. or franchise that most people know about. Yeah, Phantasm with an F. Yeah. Uh, he did a one called uh, Sky Pirates. He did mm. one called Outback Vampires. Yeah. Uh, he's just, he's had a great exploitation career. And he was written, it was written by a writer I'm mm. a big fan of uh, named uh, Everett DeRoche, who wrote several mm. of the films we already talked about, uh, including Road Games uh, and Patrick. He also wrote a, a family film I was a big fan of when I was a kid called Frog Dreaming. He wrote a film. Oh, he wrote Frog Dreaming. Okay. Yeah, he wrote Link. You ever see Link? Oh, the the, the the killer orangutan movie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Elizabeth Shue, trapped in a house, doesn't realize that an orangutan has killed like the, the guy who owns the house. And she's just walking around with this killer orangutan, not realizing it's about to murder her. And there's <laughs> one part where it like fucks with her brakes. And you're just like, this orangutan is uh, amazing! So um, it's about a couple. Their names are Peter and Marsha. And they're played by John Hargreaves and Bryony Betts. And they are, like, the worst kind of yuppie dickheads. Like, they're only concerned with conspicuous consumption, having good weekends. They're sniping at each other all the time. They kind of just hate everything. They hate each other, actually. And they don't go into too much detail about it. But uh, what we learn over the course of time is that she... They're married. Mm -hmm. She recently, or relatively recently, had an abortion. They're still arguing about it because apparently she was also having an affair. Yeah. And um, so they, 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 they think this, this vacation is going to save their marriage. There's a couple of moments where they're actually having a nice time, but mostly they hate each other and can mm. barely contain it. And yeah, he, like he goes out with a gun. He goes out by himself uh, just to sort of shoot nature. Yeah, well, one of the first <laughs> things he does, like this opens with like him mm. driving home from work and have a, it's a long weekend, you know, like a three day weekend. They're going to go out uh, to the beach and camp out. Mm. Uh, and like he's packing all this stuff and he's got his hunting rifle. And one of the first things he does when he goes home is he takes out the hunting rifle and looks at his wife through the scope. 
yeah. in the front yard, <laughs> which is just, <laughs> just bold to, to sort of test out this rifle. That so, sounds like that sounds like an important plot point on Law and Order. Like, oh, I saw him looking at his wife through a hunting rifle scope. <laughs> yeah, th- things are not good for these two. No, they're not. And they're going to go on this vacation to sort of beef up their relationship. Now, anybody who's seen Lars Venture's Antichrist knows. <laughs> This will not go well. These do not. These things do not go well. He, uh, they, they spend a lot of when they're together. When they're together, they argue, and they're not together a lot. And things are not going well when they're setting up camp. Now you can tell that these people are not experienced outdoors people. Yeah, and they're really uncomfortable with everything they do. There's ants, and they freak out at the animals, and creatures get into their tent, and they're just mm. ew, ew, yuck, get away from me, nature. And then they spend time away from each other. He spends a lot of time with the gun. Yeah, and you can tell that this gun is like a, an important symbol. It is like the the one destructive element of humanity that represents who he is. He is a gun. Well, and, and meanwhile, she's back in the tent, just sort of having her own fantasies, desperately trying to like convince him to go and stay at a hotel instead because she doesn't mm-hmm. give a shit. And he's like, "Oh well, you know, you know, you know hotels very well, don't you?" <laughs> but what's really noteworthy is like, there's this movie is actually even though it's in the when animals attack genre, mm-hmm. um, it's actually very subtle. And what's well, there's, there's, is, there's no inciting incident. Not really. For the, the an, now, the animals and nature and bugs essentially all start actively going after them. Well, or it, it seems. Yeah, You're not really sure. Hang on, hang on. Okay. I, I, I want to I frame it this way. Right. So one of the first things we see them do when they go out into the desert mm-hmm. is he flicks a, a, a lit cigarette butt like into the dry brush. Mm. They're just a destructive force. They're not, yeah, they're, they, they're not part they, of nature. They, they yeah. spray poisons. They trample yeah. over everything. The first thing yeah. they do when they get to a campsite is he starts cutting down a tree. For no and, reason. And she's like, yeah. why are you doing that? I don't know. It's a fucking tree. I don't know. <laughs> Fuck it. You know? Like, I don't care. Like, that's that's basically it. They're just a destructive force. They're not part of nature. Mm. They're a destructive force. And Everett DeRoche described the idea for the movie as this. What if nature was an ecosystem that it had, like, an, an, a, its own immune system? Mm. And when a human being becomes a cancer the system yeah. just starts fighting it. Uh, th- so is, basically, this, this is, is about the- man losing all dominion over animals. This isn't about a, a man pissing off like a like a tiger yeah, and the yeah. tiger goes off to kill him. This is about no longer, whether you believe in the religious idea or just the idea that human beings are the apex alpha predator of the planet, what happens when we're not? <laughs> well, and we've, then we it, re- it. Th- this is a movie about how modernity has unseated us. Yeah. And modernity has bolstered our confidence in the world, but has put us on the bottom. And if we yeah. were to actually face off against the overwhelming forces of nature, we'd be toast, which yeah. is what happens to this couple. And it happens in a lot. That's actually a really common trope in a mm. lot of horror movies. And we see this even in, in any sort of survivalist mm. kind of horror story. There's a lot of horror movies that begin with city people going to the country. Maybe they'll run afoul of monsters. Maybe they'll run afoul of cannibals. But yeah, chainsaw massacres. The, uh, you, you will lose count of how many horror movies begin with s- the city folk who've just learned to adapt in a city environment mm. who then discover that actual life or death have to like survive in the wild, fight off predator situation. They are useless. And... Uh- it's an anxiety. Uh, somet- worry yeah, sometimes the, the city dwellers are kind of like placid and just sort of ignorant of the mm-hmm. rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're just mean, evil people who are kind of have it coming. Yeah, look at uh, uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil for the best yeah, example of that. A great and, fucking movie. But those movies are kind of revel in the violence. This one is much, much more insidious than that because the yeah. comment is actually... Uh, portrayed in a much more subtle fashion. Mm. Um, the filmmakers are clearly trying to show us that, show us what I was talking about, how modernity, how our ability to control our environment has walled us off pretty sharply from the rest of the natural world. And we are animals to each other, but that is a poor excuse for the destruction force of forces of nature. This is essentially who can be the bigger asshole. And you know what? Nature wins. Oh, every time. <laughs> every there, time. There's a, uh, uh, there's a good bit George Carlin had mm. where he talked about how uh, environmentalists are worried about the end of the world. The world's going to be fine. Mm. The world's going to be here and we will die. Yeah. <laughs> the, hum- the human race is going to kill itself off. The planet will still exist. It will still have an ecosystem, and it will eventually equalize, and it will figure its shit out, mm. and that will be that. If you notice, if you heard that they're actually a... Uh, uh, um, I, what is it? Is it like a fungus or, an anti- or a bacterium or whatever that's actually you know, learned to eat plastic? 
Oh, that's great. I, yeah. I think I read about that. That was yeah. the idea. Like, oh, man, look at man's horrible destructive force of nature. He's plastic will be around forever. Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently nature's going to take <laughs> care of that the shit. The ecosystem is evolving. The planet is powerful mm-hmm. and mysterious and beautiful. Well, the, in, and in, that's that same, I, in that same bit, George Carlin said, the planets will shake us off like a bad case of fleas. Yeah. Um, that's what we and, and really, if you want that, to look at that, it from that cynical perspective, which this film certainly does, yeah. that's what these types of people, and possibly all people, if you really mm-hmm. think about it, are we're 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 a parasite. Mm. You know, look at what uh, 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 Hugo Weaving called us in the Matrix. We're a virus, mm. and, and the, n- the Earth is just decided. Well, the, fuck you, I guess. Get rid, get out of here. The sharp, the sharp, dark cynicism that Long Weekend espouses is what elevates it. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a countless films about you know the natural world just taking out people, and we're just there for the titillating aspect. Uh, look at the happening. Yeah, the well, happening is a great example. Of the, the happening is is. A, Strangely, an earnest comedy. I, I will defend the happening. I'm one of the only people I, who. I don't will, think it's intentionally a comedy. I've, we'll talk. We'll have that discussion another time. Probably a little someday. We'll get, we'll get to the happening. I'll talk about the happening at another time. All right. I'm not going to go to bat for it, but I'll defend it. Um, I think it's entertaining. I'll give you that. This is clearly taking a lot of the tropes of exploitation filmmaking about these people sort of being stalked and killed and being out of their element. But in making them not at all sympathetic, we are treated to a new kind of cynical philosophy that uh, really makes the film fascinating and uh, kind of salient in a way and Mm. gets us to reflect on how horrible we are as a species yeah. and there's thought in there yeah well and that's and that's something which let's be honest uh, here orca doesn't do orca well orca is about man versus nature but it's about yeah. how it's about a personal grievance there's a personal grievance there's and there's no sort of a, there's sort of a tragedy to it there's yeah. there's there's sympathy and emotion this is nothing but a, a kind of righteous, not even righteous, just indignation. Well, and that's kind of my point is I think people get confused about what a film is about versus mm. its plot. A plot is just what happens. Yeah. What's it about? What are we talking about? Why does this exist? What was the point of making this mm. beyond? And then they ran across the country and they jumped mm. in the helicopter. Oh, that's just plot. That can change. That can make no sense. If, the, mm. if what it's about works, you can get away with a lot mm. in terms of the plot. And you look at something like, look at Jaws, for mm. example. Jaws is a perfect example. Of this. Jaws is a film that is about a killer shark. That's uh-huh. the plot. But what it is really about is about the sort of fight between morality and capitalism. Mm. The idea that a purely capitalist society will downgrade human life in favor of supporting itself. It's yeah, actually the, a very dangerous the thing. The beaches remain open. Yeah, the beaches will remain open, even mm. though it's a killer shark. You can't prove to me that the shark is going to be so dangerous that it's worth losing the millions of dollars that we'll make. So if that person died, tough shit. Mm. To that extent, to that level, when you reduce it down to that base element, it's basically the same plot as Alien. All these people are meaningless because that alien is worth more no matter how many people it kills. Yes. Capitalism wins. That's what it's about. You can agree with it or disagree mm. with it, it has a theme. Orca doesn't really have a theme other than vengeance sucks. <laughs> Long Weekend, even though it is, it's incredibly sparse, mm. is really a very sharp, cynical, but very sharp expose and it's damning a cr- a criticism, indictment yeah. Yeah, of just everything we do. And it, what I love about it, because it doesn't have an inciting incident, mm. well, it feels and, like it can happen to anybody. Like, I'm not going it, to go out killing si- killer whales, so Orca's not going to fight me. Mm. I, whereas, whereas I, could, I could throw a cigarette butt into the bush, yeah, you know, I, 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 could, I, I could just not be sensitive enough. Think about any time that you've been out in public and you threw away a piece of trash and it didn't land in the garbage can and, and he didn't you, pick and it you up. Walked away I've done that way. and I'm ashamed of it. But my point is that what if that was the one one time too many, and then and, and then nature itself said fuckers gotta die. Well, and here's what I like: nature doesn't rally, and the film is so quiet, and the suspense builds over the course of such a long span that the characters and the audience don't really know what's going on at first. And in yeah. fact, you're not really, you don't really grab onto the fact that nature is trying to take these people out until about halfway through the movie. Oh, I, it, it, honestly, it's, if you didn't know the poster a, or the tagline, maybe not even then. It's this a isn't like threat. Final Destination where it's super fucking obvious. Mm. It's just after a while, like this, the animals aren't really afraid of them. 
Yeah. Like, they'll bite them. They don't give a well, shit. And, and you could, again, you can chalk this up as, you could even see it as sort of a dark comedy up to a point, mm-hmm. where these people are such bad outdoors people, and they're just such dicks that they're not bothering to learn about you know, what it is to camp, Yeah, that they're just sort of being hoisted by their own petards. There's even a, uh, there's plenty of comedy versions of this story. Oh, absolutely. Think about every time, every uh, comedy you've seen where it's just like, there's a good person mm. and a bad <clears throat> person doing the same thing, and the bad person's doing shitty mm. things. Mickey and, Mouse and Peg Leg Pete, for yeah, God's sake. Yeah, same, same exact fucking puppet. Mm. You take away Mickey Mouse, and but righteous virtue, indignation, vengeance mm. needs to happen anyway, even if there isn't an instrument. So mm. nature's got to do it itself. And yeah, for most part, it's really subtle. It gets increasingly obvious towards the end, but never ridiculous. Well, it the, never strains completely. Right, right, right at the end, there's a cr- an incredulous thing. I don't want to say what happens. But it's not, it involves but even, a hawk. Uh, <laughs> okay, the hawk is a bit weird, but yeah. like even so, like it's still like. Okay, the worst version of this I've ever seen, and I'm curious if you've seen it, mm. is Frogs. I've seen Frogs. Frogs is one of the worst fucking movies ever. It's terrible. And, and it's, it's pretty not, terrible. And it's not Orca bad. It's just unwatchably boring. Mm. Frogs? Because frogs would, aren't as threatening as a killer whale. Well, it's not even about frogs. Frogs is a story about a bunch of people. I think they're on a bayou, and nature decides to fucking kill everybody today. It's like the birds. Mm. Another, another one which make a good double feature, but a little obvious. Um... And uh, just nature decides this. Every time someone leaves the house, nature gets them. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. They just, every once in a while, someone leaves the house and nature gets them. And they're all boring, shitty, lame characters. I mean, these are shitty characters. Like, they're bad but people. The, I these, reject these are the, shitty by design. Yeah, I reject the idea that characters in a story need to be likable. They don't. They need to or, be... Or even sympathetic, really. They need to be distinctive. Yeah. I need to recognize them. And if, they, if I don't like them, I, it helps... If I get the impression that the movie has a similar viewpoint, mm. I think it's one of the reasons why that movie Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, is getting divisive, a lot of controversy. Yeah. It's very divisive right now because I think uh, uh, it, for better or worse, and you can say it's shitty design, or you can say it's simply doing what it's out to do for better or worse. Um, there's a lot of terrible characters, terrible people. Mm. Well, they're, they're rich characters, but they're terrible human beings, and. There isn't a clear design in the narrative to get them their comeuppance. If anything, the, design, or, the narrative to, is designed to be too nice to them. And yeah. that's it's easy to reject that. Yeah. Just hate that. And I yeah. totally get that. I I think it's just sort of look ma, watch me dive, look at how audacious I can be with mm. my character development or lack thereof. But uh, yeah, it's really rubbing some people the wrong way. And I totally fucking get it. And if you want to look at it as irresponsible filmmaking, it totally fucking is. Mm. But uh, yeah, it, it is because we don't get a sense of whose side is the filmmaker on. Mm. Here, it's very clear. Yeah. It's subtle, but it's very, it, it's subtly designed, it's subtly acted. There's not a lot of laying out of the plot. Mm. And, uh, but but it's, it's very clear. And these characters, we keep describing them as like you know, jerks and dickheads, and they don't do do or say anything like positive or constructive at all. They're not just really, constantly no. sniping at each other. There's a way to also depict this type of character, which is too far. Oh. How, for however horrible these people are, and you know, they're spraying poison and they're mm. shooting trees for no reason. There's also a way to just sort of have them like take out a can of motor oil and just dump it in water. They're, yeah. they're like like a villain in a Captain Planet cartoon. Yeah, like they're not. There's a, there's a way where they could just say, "I hate nature and I'm going to wreck things on purpose." They're wrecking things because that's their character. They're wrecking things because they don't know enough to care. Yeah, and that is, and they em- di- and they embrace that ignorance as their strength. At some point in every human being's life. You've been that person, even mm. if it was just a bad day, mm. where you just you don't care, fuck everything, fuck them. I'm going to be a jerk today. Yeah. Um, and this movie argues that there are consequences for that, and that is a scary thought, and yep. that should give us all pause. And the fact that it is subtle about what causes the horror, um, I mean, they they run over a kangaroo in a car. That's pretty bad, well, but yeah. like I don't think it's specifically to get vengeance for the kangaroo. They do a whole bunch of little things, mm. um, and they all are portrayed with the same amount of portent. Like, ooh, this might be the thing. Um, yeah, it should make you rethink everything you do, uh, because life is a series of little choices. We tend to think of the big ones, and the big ones can define you, mm. but there's a lot of little ones, and they can add up. It, it, er, erosion is a much more destructive force than a single stick of dynamite. And erosion will, er, yeah, a single <laughs> stick of dynamite will knock some rocks off a mountain. Erosion will kill a mountain. Just give it enough time. Um, and this is about, uh, humanity's, uh, short-sightedness yeah. and 
lack of empathy and loss of sight of our own place in the natural world. And you know, the older as I get, the, as the, a corrosive force that needs to be curtailed. And the older I get, the scarier that is. You know, when I'm, when I'm young, I'm like, oh no, a giant monster looks like a fun bicolored yeah. dolphin, but whatever, it's a giant monster. That's fun. That's scary. And now I'm just like, you know, it's really fucking scary existentialism <laughs> it really fucking yeah. is now th- this isn't nearly as uh deep a dive as something like wake and fright another no. really terrific os- not even osploitation movie just a great piece of cinema yeah um uh, but it does have similar themes about how sort of going out into the australian bush mm-hmm. is pretty much a recipe for disaster because that thing is way more powerful than you um and it will drive you crazy and <laughs> it doesn't matter how angry you get it's going to stamp you into the dirt a uh, long weekend is uh not readily available on any streaming service that i am aware of orca mm. you can get on like amazon video mm. rent it for a couple of bucks uh, long, long weekend, weekend you're gonna need to track down on a dvd it's on but DVD, it is it's on, and it's been released on blu-ray as well yeah it's a so, nice looking yeah. blu-ray actually that's what I watched, and uh, you 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 rented it and loaned it to me. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's worth tracking down mm. if you like art house horror. Yeah, uh, this yeah. is definitely a really great film that people do not talk about enough, and it will, it's really rewarding. Even though, obviously, as I said, it's very mm. um, understated in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so that is the critically acclaimed double feature. It's a double feature. Should I read some letters? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, you can email us critically acclaimed fans at gmail uh, with questions. Concerns, mm-hmm. ideas, thoughts, whatever mm-hmm. you want, really. <laughs> and we'll, we read as many as we can, but we get a lot, and it's hard to, yeah, to keep if, up. If, if they're shorter, we'll probably read it. Shorter There's a easier. better chance that we'll read it. Yeah. Um, but we, we appreciate every letter, so right, what do we feel got? free. Um, this one comes from Daniel. Hello. Hello. Hey, guys. I was thinking about... Battle of the Sexes. Hmm. We wrote about Battle of the Sexes, which we didn't review on this show, but uh, we, it, came, it came out last year. We, so. we did it when we like uh, uh, ran through all the movies we didn't review between podcasts. That's true. So we talked about it really yeah. briefly. Um, uh, when everyone was doing their top ten lists, no one had it on their list. Uh, I then realized that the things I liked about the movie, aside from the characters and story, which were delightful, was the plot of a gay person standing against a system that will hold her down and the fact that she that she was gay didn't matter much. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the thing that uh, it wasn't the thing that everyone found that people found out that didn't really affect the story that much. That is, um, it is great seeing a gay person doing cool things separated from being gay. Uh, plus, there's a delightful gay couple hanging around. Uh, do you have any movies that you feel were made just for you? Oh, um, that's interesting. Um, for uh, as for gay characters in movies, w- you and I survived through the wave of gay indie romances in the 1990s. Some of which were better uh, than others. Some of are, some are better than others. There are some really good ones, mm-hmm. and there are some pretty bad ones in there. That's true. Because, and I saw a lot of these, the filmmakers assumed that the characters were interesting merely because they were gay. That was their only character trait. Yeah. I've seen a lot of movies like that. Yeah. <clears throat> Jeffrey. Kiss Me Guido. Kiss Me Guido is terrible. Yeah. It, <laughs> and, and yet, and yet, there are so few, I speak, coming from an Italian-American family, uh-huh. there are so few like comedies that even give lip service to the idea of the Italian-American culture uh-huh. that my parents liked that movie anyway just because of the Italian-American side. It was a broad caricature <laughs> of the Italian-Americans too, but we were just like, you know what? It's uh-huh. nice to be there. <laughs> yeah, it was about a, a Guido meets a gay guy. Can what they do they do? Oh my God. <laughs> Stupid What's the gay guy man. like? Well, he's gay. <laughs> What's the Italian guy like? He's, he's Italian. Italian. There's a bit where they're gonna move and like, oh, he's because he's, his girlfriend like leaves him like right away, like in first scene, so he's got to move out right uh-huh. away. And he tells his friend, "Hey, the Italian American friend, come on, bring bring some boxes. I got to move out of my apartment." And he brings a bunch of pizza boxes because he's oh, Italian, God. don't you know? And my parents and I are going, "Oh, God damn it." There's, there was a gag Johnny in there. Johnny Stacchino, this is not. <laughs> There's a gag in there that I actually still repeat, where the, the guy's looking through, uh, looking for a roommate in the paper. Oh, yeah. But he accidentally is reading through the personals. Yeah. It was like, uh, TV, looking for a roommate. So what? He's got a TV. <laughs> but t- TV was personals uh, code for a transvestite. Yeah, and he missed, and he, uh, he, he thought... Uh, uh, GWM uh, was guy with money. Guy with Looking money. for guy with money. I got money. <laughs> GWM. He's a guy with Stupid money. Fucking back on point. I- I'll right. tell you. I'll but tell you. But it uh, took uh, a little while for gay characters to become a little more nuanced. Is my go. point. Uh, a couple of movies that came out really recently that felt like they were made uh, just for me. Mm. Although I, every person I've able to get to see them loves them too. So good, but they didn't find much of an audience. Uh, Christine, starring Rebecca right. Hall, is a fantastic motion picture about uh, anxiety mm. and depression and the extreme uh, 
depths of just misery that those can lead you through, mm-hmm. and it doesn't feel exploitative. It's just really almost shockingly mm-hmm. insightful, and it's brilliant, and I love it, and it's mm-hmm. really, really great. And the other one was, um, uh, there's two actually, just a bunch of films about grief came out in the last couple of years. Mm. A bunch of really good films well, about 20, processing 2016, grief. there were like 12 films that were all about the, the, the grieving process. Yeah, and a lot of them were fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, one in particular really, really got me was A Monster Calls, ah. um, which you found like a little blunt. But yeah, for it's, it's, as someone who kind had, of a trite film, but, yeah. I can appreciate that. But speaking as someone who had only recently at the time lost his father, yeah. father died a few years ago, um, that movie was basically an accelerated course in my therapy. Mm. Like everything I went through in order to find a way to process grief, which I'd never felt on that level before. I'd never mm. lost anyone as close to me as that. Um, that movie got me through all the state, would go through all the stages super organically, mm. beautifully, in a way that's complicated enough that it appreciates that there's nuance and every experience is different. It's really, really great, and it's a great film about the grieving process. Mm. Um, there's also another film uh, called The Boy and the Beast, uh, which was uh, uh, done by Mamoru Hosoda. Same mm. guy who did Summer Wars, which is one of my favorite movies. Uh, one of my favorite movies. Uh, <laughs> and that's also a story about a, a boy and his father, and that really hit really close to home to me, too. No, okay. But, uh, yeah. Now, what about any others? Uh, when I'm going through, like, miserable times, I mean... I- I feel like my anxiety is too strong a beast. No art can face my anxiety. I, I cannot watch a film and, and have it be a salve. So when I go to see a film uh, that's that I feel like was made for me, it's something that caters kind of to my interests. And one that I saw last year, Manifesto, which I was t- t- like trumpeting from the hilltops and nobody saw, uh, is... It is just like right up my alley. It's like after seeing all of these commercial films and talking about them and reviewing all of these very similarly structured films, very screenplay heavy, very you know, plot and characters, and they have the similar kinds They're of entertainments. catharsis, just entertainments. I saw this like bold, pretentious, like snooty art school art film that like was refreshing parts of me that hadn't been touched in a long time. Mm. And I felt like it was just what I needed at the time just to get my love of cinema back on track. Well, I'm a firm believer that, mm. um, you know, they say that every movie is someone's favorite movie. Uh-huh. That's not true. There are too many movies. Uh, but And too many people have the same movie, so it's, mm. it's not possible. But um, what I do believe is that every movie can come... Uh, sorry, any movie can come mm. along at exactly the right time. Yeah. Uh, all these movies that you see that have the exact same message over mm. and over and over again, and they're like, well, I already know that. Someone doesn't. Mm. Or someone forgot today. Or, uh, or you know, a fourteen-year-old is seeing that for the first time. Also yeah, true. You're not fourteen anymore. There's a, there's a movie uh, Disney came out with a couple of years ago. I mm-hmm. mentioned this a few times in various contexts, but mm-hmm. it's a story I hold true just because no one remembers the movie, but it meant something to me that day. Mm-hmm. Million Dollar Arm, starring John <laughs> Hamm as a guy who recruits a bunch uh, of Indian cricket players to play baseball in America. Mm-hmm. It is as tried as you could get. If you could, Disney could sort have made that as started, a made-for-TV movie in the '70s and they, would have been the exact are same you, thing. They could have made that with. Fred McMurray in 1950. That's my point. It's that (laughs) trite and obvious. I mean, it's based on a true story and that's fine, Mm. but like as a movie, it's just, it's sub cool runnings. Like it's, Mm. it's, it's mild runnings. Like it's just (laughs) mild runnings. (laughs) But here's the thing. It's well made enough. Yeah. You know, it's not a bad movie. So Mm. I'm, I'm watching and invested in it. And ultimately a big part of the movie is just the importance of you got to love what you do. If you don't love what you do, why are you doing it? Mm. That's a simple message. You probably didn't need to be reminded of that. But you know what I need to be reminded of that day? That. <laughs> All right. I forgot that. I, right. hated, I hated everything I was doing. And I was like, you know what? Why am I doing it if I don't like it? I, I keep doing it if I like it. And if I don't, I'll do something else. Mm. That's it. And I needed that that day. And I okay. didn't quit my job that day. <laughs> like, that's what it boiled down <laughs> to. So Million Dollar Arm, of mm. all things, was an important movie to me that day. <laughs> Would I tell anyone, like, you got to see it's a life-changing movie? No. No. But something is going to be a weird life-changing movie mm. to you. You're going to see a movie. You're going to read a book. Completely unexpected. No one else is going to give a shit about it. Might not even be good. But it's going to be what you need that day. And that is why mm. we keep consuming art. <laughs> so that we can find the things that are important. Yeah. Yeah. Want to read another, read another letter? letter? All right. This one comes from somebody who's signing themselves as Green Lobster. Fun. Hello, Green Lobster. Sounds like um, a great superhero. <laughs> the Green Lobster. Yeah. I watched that movie. 
He's got a ring. Uh, hey, guys. <laughs> Yesterday, my friend was talking about how she would like to see a remake of A Clockwork Orange. Uh, before you groan and throw this email into the garbage, I'm let listening. me explain. I'm listening. Uh, she agrees that Kubrick's original film is great, but as a fan of the original novel, I would love to see a complete, completely faithful adaptation now that we don't have as much censoring as we did in 1970. I don't know. That film's pretty extreme. It's pretty harsh. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, I explained how while we might, uh, while that might be interesting, it most likely would end up being pointless because what's the point of adapting a book into a movie when you're just going to do the book? For one, I think back on some of my favorite books, Fight Club and Salem's Lot. Uh, what makes them great isn't so much the sequence of events, but how the author writes those events. Huh. The best adaptations are the ones that take the source material and put a spin on the material. I agree with that. I think it's mostly um, true. Yeah. If I just want to see the exact sequence of events play out, I'll just go read the book. Let's bring uh, bring it back to Fight Club. David Finch, uh, Fincher's film does stay close to the book in terms of its story, but Fincher puts his own stamp on it. When I watch Fight Club, there's no denying that it is a Fincher film, and when I read the book, there's no denying that it is a Palinuk book. A lot of the times I find a film tries too hard to be the book it's based on, and it fails. I think there is an overemphasis, mm-hmm. and I think the, the geek community is largely responsible for this, on fealty in adaptation. Harry, uh, Harry Potter. Well, I think it's important... Yeah. I remember when the when the Harry Potter three came out and mm-hmm. the Prisoner of Azkaban, and they introduced the Dementors. Mm-hmm. And in the movie, the Dementors, a completely fictional, like fictional for fiction, like <laughs> like J.K. Rowling just made that up. It's not like vampires, and she she made it her own. Mm-hmm. She just made those fuckers up. And in the movie, they can fly. And mm-hmm. I talked to Harry Potter fans who were pissed. Oh, they can't fly in the books. They can't fly in the books. Right. And I'm like, who gives a shit? Yeah. Like that's <laughs> that's some nitpicky well, shit. But like there's it, a difference. Well, and but that see that that's a flying thing is visually dynamic. Now maybe there's a way to shoot something that's just sort of stalking around hallways to make it scary. Clearly, that filmmaker like has a lot of swirling, like light mm-hmm. camera movements. Alfonso Cuarón uh, directed that one, and yeah. and he really like and he really likes to sort of push the camera around and do these really dynamic things to the point where it's really obnoxious. In fact, there's <laughs> a there's a scene where like, he's like constantly zooming into a mirror, and it's like, oh, this looks it looks like a music video. It's really dynamic. It makes no sense in the context of the scene. It's adding flair to something that doesn't need it. Um, it's when you get to the later Harry Potter films, uh, five through eight, where they're so hellbent on including every character and event from the book that it's not really bothering to give it the pacing or the import of a film, and it becomes less and less cinematic as you go on, and the films start to fail as films. They stop being well-told stories, and they start feeling like illustrations. And what's mm. weird, I did an article when the Harry Potter movies ended, which was basically all the things the Harry Potter movies left out. Mm. Some of them, just little details that were fun. Yeah. Didn't really need him. That character, I didn't need that character. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, every once in a while, there's something like, no, eh, they didn't realize how important that would be later. <laughs> like, they cut that out thinking it's not important to this movie, but in the seventh movie, we would really have helped if we established that. Yeah, like, so it doesn't really get cut. Like, like, like uh, uh, the, the fact that Ron has another older brother who yeah. just so, suddenly shows up the, in one of the his movies. wedding is yeah. really important in the books. And then the oh, movies okay. are like, oh shit, we never made him a thing. Or like uh, towards the end, it's like, oh yeah, all the ghosts... Mm-hmm. All the ghosts that, that are were in the first, yeah, the first movie, yeah, yeah. And the first, I think, in the second as well, and they just sort of like gave them a pass because they're expensive to put in there. You don't mm-hmm. really need them, and it's like, oh yeah, the ghosts have been there forever, and they were really important in the last story because they can tell you shit that happened like centuries mm-hmm. ago. That was really important to the story, and you kind of <laughs> forgot about them for a while, and whatever. Like, so yeah. like, damn. But like, there's, but then they would like in Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince. Mm. They never explain what a half blood prince is. Yeah, they tell you who the half blood prince was. I'm oh. not going to ruin it for you if you haven't seen it. It's, it's the end of the movie, whatever. They tell you who it referred to. They never explain why the fuck that matters. Uh-huh. The books explain why the fuck that matters. The movies don't get to that. It's a weird <laughs> thing considering how slavishly faithful no. they were to every other thing, no. and they left that out. It will never cease to amuse me. When it comes to adapting, um, like certain great works of literature, mm-hmm. say you're doing another Wuthering Heights, there's been a thousand of those. Yeah. Or, you know, another Jane Eyre. Yeah. Or, or another Shakespeare. Especially Shakespeare. Shakespeare. There, there's, well, Shakespeare works particularly well because it's a play and those were meant to be restaged. Yeah. And, and plus, and, the, the language is all about the poetry. So, really yeah. reveling in the language really kind of binds you in in a certain way that's really yeah. satisfying, yeah. I think. Shakespeare was never. But, Shakespeare's plays were never meant to be done, they were supposed to yeah. be constantly recreated. We're so familiar with the tone of these things that it's okay to start playing around with details so long as you get the tone right. A Jane Eyre story can have a zombie in it. A, a and indeed it does. And, and indeed it, and there's I Walked With a Zombie is the Jane Eyre story. And it's a really good movie. Yeah, so... 
And I wouldn't call I Walked With a Zombie a bad adaptation of Jane Eyre no, it's because it one, strays actually. from the source material. Yeah. It's, and, it, gets, it gets what you need to get right. Mm. What, you, what it boils down I, to I, is... When, you, when, you, mm. when you're when you making it into a film, what you, need to know, what you need to remember is you're making a film. You need to remember that a film operates differently than any other medium. Yeah. And you're going to have to make it a dynamic in a cinematic sort of way. Yeah. And if that means cutting out most of the details and just doing what's essential to the story, that will make it a better adaptation than it would if you were to make eight films that include every detail. Well, I'm looking at you, Peter Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and even he managed to change a bunch of stuff to piss people off. Yeah. But I think the thing we need to think about that we're not thinking about enough is literally the word adaptation. Mm. If you remove adaptation from the context of taking a comic book or a book or a video game or another movie or whatever mm. and turning it into a new movie, and you look at it in nature, mm. adaptation is about change. Yeah. Adaptation is about making and key adjustments to things so that it can thrive in new environments, new contexts, new times. Hmm. That's what adapt. That's the reason why it's a different Academy Award than an original screenplay. It's because you yeah, have to take a, the source a, material, a different art. Yeah. You have to take the source material and change it. If sometimes you only have to change it relatively subtly, there's a lot of books that are written very cinematically, hmm. and you can translate well, them pretty straightforward. Especially since cinema took over, a lot of books have become a lot more visual. Yeah, You'll like, notice the language is describing visual things rather than feelings. And, and a lot of those are often hmm. very entertaining books, like the James Bond books. Hmm. Translate, <laughs> even though they stopped translating them faithfully after a while, they're, they pretty much just lift off the page onto a screenplay. You really don't need to change that much. But if you did Metamorphosis, you'd have to change a bunch of shit to make it a movie, because movies work in a different confines. They have to work in a specific amount of time. You have to hold mm. people's attention every single second. It's a change. Mm. Some of the best movies ever made are, if, you're, if you firmly believe that adaptations need to be faithful, shitty adaptations. Mm. Wizard of Oz is not a good adaptation would never fly today imagine if at the end of the harry potter movies they're like and it was all a dream (laughs) everybody like the fuck fuck you what the hell you can't do that but thanks to um lord of the rings harry potter and twilight like those those three in particular Mm, uh, twilight changed a bunch in the last book in the last book in the last movie it it changed changed a lot but yeah and it pissed people off, and it made some people really happy because it's a better yeah, yeah, ending. Yeah. <laughs> it's a way better ending. There, but it began this trend of, especially with recent pop books, of staying as close to the source material as possible. And I think the cinema suffered as a result. Mm. Uh, Hunger Games, I think, is another one where they're just sort of expanding it and trying to include as many details as they can. Well, especially rather like, than trying to get at the heart of the matter. And what's weird is that sometimes they, when they choose to like expand, okay, we're going to take this book and we're going to make mm. two movies out of it. Sometimes that book really wasn't worth making two movies out of. Like the last two Hunger Games movies, didn't need to not, be two movies. There's not really enough material for two whole movies in there. You made the last one like one long action sequence. It was a cool action sequence. Oh. You really could have made like one two and a half hour movie, and you would have been fun. <laughs> you really could have taken the entire event of the third Hunger Games movie and made it like the first forty minutes of a movie, yeah, and, and it would have been fine. I think this, and this is going going to a larger. We, we're spending a long time on this letter. It's, it's fine, a big, it's I think a there's, big there's conversation, a big thing. Right now, and I think this speaks to a larger problem in the way people have come to think about story. And you look at something like The Hunger Games. That's actually a really simple story. In Pretty fact, it started story. as a short story. The most, da- really? most dangerous game is, is a short oh, is a okay. very short okay. book. Literally, it's, um, it's inspired by the most dangerous yeah. game, which was a short now, story. Hunger Games. There wasn't a short story called The Hunger it, Games that turned into a novel. When it comes to story, when you think of story as a concept, storytelling as a concept, people have started to think of the details within a story as indispensable. When like, how do you tell the Harry Potter story? Well, you have to include all of these details and all these characters. Not necessarily. Mm. When you start boiling it down and looking at the actual skeleton of what Harry Potter is, you can actually tell the entire Harry Potter story, just the story, in maybe ten minutes. You can actually mm-hmm. reduce it that much. Mm-hmm. That's how little you need to tell this story. It's the embellishments that people are attaching themselves but to. But the embellishments is what give it personality. It's, it's what, what give it give personality, us, you know. but I think people are becoming so fixated on the embellishments that they feel that they're necessary, and they're not. You can actually make a really corker story adaptation when you just sort of cut off all of the fat. And I adm- and you can actually I, I really admire this uh there's a really funny website out there called Angry Alien that mm. does 
like one minute adaptations of famous feature films. Oh yeah, they I've, they I've they, they shrink them down to one minute and they hit all the plot points. And you can tell how strong a story is if it can be told in one minute. Mm-hmm. You look at something like Casablanca, you can tell that really quick, mm-hmm. and it's you can get a lot of the same effectiveness out of it. There are exceptions to this rule. Of course, there are exceptions. I just want to make that someone's already angrily. Against, I understand the, my point the idea is, is to be argumentative, and, but like, and you look you yeah. look at some like uh, long form TV. It's like well, we're just sort of focusing on the details, whereas the actual story in old, the old mm. old days of TV could be reduced down to a single hour. You could summarize the entire plot of Breaking Bad in about one page. Yeah, if you really yeah. had to, you'd be and cutting a lot out. But like, I feel like give, the important character arc would I, be there. I feel like an anthology series are really nailing my point home. You can tell a really great dynamic science fiction tale with a really great message and really interesting characters within the span of an hour, and it cuts off, and that's all you need. Yeah. Um, you could take that exact same story within an anthology series and turn it an entire feature film or an entire season of TV, yeah. depending on how many details you want to add in. The point is that gigantic, like overarching story is just embellishing something that's very simple. To make a long story short, <laughs> that adaptations are okay. Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, what boils down to is is the thing good, and if you don't like an adaptation. Eventually, they'll make another one. Like that's the thing; they're going to make another one. Like I know some people who really hated the adaptation Paul Verhoeven did of Starship Troopers because Star- it's not faithful to the book. It's really not. It's not even faithful to the idea of the book because the idea of the Starship Troopers is actually like recommended reading in the military mm. because it is very pro military. Mm. It's very, 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 very pro military. That's like the whole point, uh, basically. Where, Whereas the, 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 the movie the, is about the the destruction it rots on humanity and their souls and just has turned humanity into this empty military fighting for the, the movie is a fake propaganda film mm. you can appreciate it on a superficial level but if you appreciate it on a superficial level it means you are you are have to be willfully mm. ignoring fascist subtext <laughs> it's very challenging it's a fucking brilliant movie it's not a faithful adaptation and a, and they've been talking about doing a more faithful adaptation more power to them. I fine, used to be fine. really, I used to be really upset about that. How dare they remake? If they announced they were remaking Clockwork Orange, how dare they remake Clockwork Orange? There was a time when I would have been like that. Now I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. It's a, it's I don't fine. even care. It's a famous. I don't you know even what? care anymore. I really don't. The 1972 film is so good, and it's yeah. still really accessible, and it's still really dark, and I think the point yeah. is still salient, that well, it would be kind of useless to remake A Clockwork well, Orange. I don't think but, so. But, um, mm. again, I haven't read the book, so ah. I don't know how faithful the, here's, the here, Kubrick adaptation is. Here, here's, here's what it boils down to. If you have a new way of doing it, if you have a new idea, good for Go it. For it. If, Go for if, it. Especially if it's like politically salient. Yeah, and the Clockwork um, Orange, Kubrick left out the last chapter of the book. Oh yeah, uh, uh, it's my understanding. That's that's mm. where the cutoff was, and apparently it's because uh, the last chapter wasn't published in every market, and Kubrick oh, okay. didn't get the one with the final chapter in it. And it's my understanding, based on what I've read about the production, if Kubrick had known about the final chapter, he would have included it. Okay, so there is actually Although a that, different film it ends really well. It ends yeah. really well, but it ended differently. Right. And if you want, and it makes a different point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you wanted to do that, you could. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'd be good. <laughs> Maybe you'd make it great. <laughs> Who knows? There's a lot of people always say remakes suck. There's a lot of brilliant remakes out there, mm. like legit, yeah. brilliant remakes. It, Good, <laughs> make another one. It, 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 so, but sometimes, especially you know, in, in recent years, when they're just remaking everything, and you you get a whiff of cynicism in every frame, it's yeah. difficult to appreciate how the film is being made. If you're only remaking it because the title has monetary value. Mm. You shouldn't be remaking that. Yeah. You might make your studio more money, but you're wasting everyone's time because if you made a good remake that actually did something different or had a different vibe or felt like it was updated to approach modern, the good version, a good at an example of this, I know you didn't like as much as I did, was it. Oh, it is okay. a remake of the miniseries. I don't give a shit <laughs> if it was, a, you're saying that it was an adaptation of the same book. Mm. They made it once, they made it again. They remade it. Mm. They literally remade it. Mm. And you know what? They really captured something this time. People really responded to it. Mm. People liked that new version. The old version's still really good, too. All right. I just think there was a reason to do that. We had a new sensibility to bring to it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, let's do one last letter. One last letter. This okay. one comes from Michael. Hello, Michael. Hello. Hey, William and Whitney. I've got a random question that's probably not that interesting. But I'm personally curious to hear your thoughts. Well, let's hear your not interesting question. Okay. Do you consider Jerry Maguire to be a sports film? Sure. Sure. My personal <laughs> film. <laughs> I have personal thoughts, but I'll talk to, tackle them on another platform. Thanks for taking my question. Love your guys' work. Wish you success, Michael. I was having this conversation, I'm trying to remember what context now, about 
uh, whether or not uh, oh, we were, I was having a conversation online. And mm-hmm. I was Brian Chandler was briefly involved, and then she washed her hands of it and said, "I, I don't care anymore, and good for her." Mm-hmm. But I was talking to someone on Twitter about whether dance movies are a genre, and um, Mo- I think th- most assuredly, of course they are. Yeah. Um, genre, and I think the argument against dance movies is that many of them aren't very good. Most no. movies aren't very good. <laughs> That's true for everything. It's true for most books. Oh. Most books suck. I'm going to throw that out there. <laughs> there's a lot of bad books out there. But there's a lot of brilliant books, and you need to read all of them. So there mm. you go. Um, genre mm-hmm. uh, is not a qualitative statement. Genre is a collection of similarities. <laughs> it is a collection of similarities that form a basis of expectation. Mm. So that when you see a movie, you expect that these bullet points will be hit if you're making a movie within that genre, you you plan to hit or address, mm-hmm. if you change them, these basic bullet points. Uh, sports movies, basically all it needs to boil down to to be a sports movie is the plot needs to revolve around sports. Mm. It doesn't necessarily need to revolve around the competition behind sports. Uh-huh. There's a lot of sports movies that really aren't about the competition that much. You look at Rocky, most of that movie is training. Mm. It's not, the, the actual fight takes up a very small <laughs> amount of the movie. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not all about the actual sporting conflict Mm -hmm. it's just about does the story exist without the existence of sports if the answer is no i say it's a sports movie (laughs) jerry Maguire is about the sports community it is about uh the way that we treat Mm -hmm. athletes as commodities uh it is about uh, the business of sports perhaps more than sports itself it doesn't boil down to the big game it's more about the romance of the sports agent but uh the backdrop of the football player and the fact that he is playing and the fact that this is a very important element of sports definitely makes it a sports movie. Draft Day is a sports movie. Absolutely. I think you could probably make Jerry Maguire as if he was like a movie agent. You probably mm. could make that movie. Mm. I think it would have a very different vibe. It would be feel more superficial. There's a certain purity to sports. It's the reason why sports movies, including dance movies, if you want to include them as an adjunct, uh, are such great fodder for cinema. They're visceral. There's a purity well, to them. It's just competition. The competition, dance movies even more so, because mm. dance movies are true. Uh, it doesn't matter what the story is or what the characters are. You point a camera at somebody and they dance well. That's a real thing. Yeah. That's something that cannot be faked. Yeah. It's uh, the art of creation. You can kind of edit around a bad dancer. But <coughs> Chicago. Can, but you can tell when that's going on. <coughs> if, Specifically Richard Gere in Chicago. <laughs> people dance in Chicago. <coughs> <coughs> Or his Arger. Learn, learn the stuff's okay. <coughs> not clearly, not a professional dancer. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have a cough today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you, you go to something like Step Up 3D, which is the greatest motion picture of all time. Uh, and the camera. I'm not arguing. S- the camera stays back, <laughs> yeah. lets the dancers dance. Let's us see the amazing choreography at work. Mm-hmm. Cuts it's, very few times. And it's about and dancing. You, it's about the art form of dancing. It's about the art form of dancing, but more than that, it's just enjoyable to see people dancing well. It's like with a good fight scene. If it's a good, a well choreographed fight and you see people actually doing these wonderful physical things, that's one of the things that makes cinema very pure. Mm-hmm. It's like when you blow up a real car versus CGI. And people say, tell. ah, CGI. Well, you know what? If you blow up a real car, people got around, put a bunch of dynamite in a car, and pointed a camera at it. Now that's, that's magic. That's movie magic at work, my friend. Yeah. Like here's the thing: Jerry Maguire is about all like the bullshit that rose up around sports. Sports mm. is just people on a playing field competing. Mm. That's pure too. It's very simple. Yeah. Uh, but what happened around it was it became a. a, 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 a Come on, I'm yeah. a financial institution. Yeah. And people started f- focusing more on other things mm. than the actual sport. And that's what Jeremy McQuarrie is about. It's about people who got so wrapped up in all the other bullshit that they mm. missed the, the really important thing going on right now, whether that's the sport that you're playing or the person you married. Mm. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I say Jeremy McQuarrie's a sports movie. It's maybe not the, a prototypical example of a sports movie. Mm. If you asked me, hey, what are the rules that I need to follow in order to make a good sports movie? I'd probably point you more towards Rocky. You know, yeah. than than I would towards uh, uh, Jerry Maguire because Jerry Maguire is a little harder to to copy, <laughs> uh, a little harder to take that mm. framework and apply it to something else. But yeah, a sports movie. Mm. Yeah. Interesting conversation, though. We live in a cynical world. <laughs> <laughs>
You're you're doing the Pat Oswalt. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's fine. I, I didn't want to just yell out the line <laughs> because if you don't know it, it's gonna read real weird. Okay. Pat, Pat Oswalt has a really great bit about how he feels about Jerry Maguire. Well, how his brother feels about Jerry uh, Maguire. Uh, so that is it. That is it for the critically acclaimed podcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to send us an email, you can do so. Critically acclaimed fans at gmail dot com. If you are listening to us on YouTube on the SK Plus YouTube channel, feel free mm-hmm. to leave us a comment. Uh, we do give them a look over. We don't respond terribly often uh, because well, because they're. We'll YouTube, get, they're yeah. Well, their YouTube comments, but like you know, like a lot of the YouTube comments have been really nice and really supportive, mm-hmm. and that's really great. I just really appreciate it. We we do read them, uh, but we can fall down a rabbit hole of just only responding to comments yeah, and then not yeah. doing our job. <laughs> so don't. That's not a slight against you. We really really appreciate mm-hmm. it. So thank you for leaving the comments there. Uh, you can also listen to us on the Schmozno iTunes feed. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're listening to us on YouTube right now, subscribe to the iTunes feed, uh, and you get all the other shows on the Schmozno network, like the Wanger Show and Top Ten and bunch of really great programming there uh you can follow us on twitter all of them quite good about almost as good as ours <laughs> you're a jerk um uh, and uh, we're on twitter i'm on twitter at william bibiani i'm at whitney seibel we also have another podcast on a separate network called canceled too soon you can just subscribe to that on its own on mm. itunes stitcher wherever fine podcasts are found we review television series that lasted only one season or less this week we're reviewing law and order los angeles <laughs> which was the winner of a poll on our patreon page patreon.com slash canceled too soon and if you go to the schmoville facebook page you can vote on our next poll now, next week on the on the Critically Acclaimed, we're going to be reviewing the latest film in the Maze Runner series, but we're also going to be reviewing an entire movie franchise. Mm, we're going which to be we re- do once a month. And it's, it's chosen by our fans on Facebook, and this month, y'all chose the Lethal Weapon movies. Okay, mm. so we're going to review those next week. Be fun. But we need to figure out what, we're, what franchise we're going to review next month. So at the end of February, we're going to re- review one of these franchises, and we just find out which one by looking at the poll that you vote on. So go to the Schmoville facebook page sign up and you're going to vote for one of these films or one of these franchises the beach party movies <laughs> from the 1960s beach blanket bingo <laughs> if you've never so seen many them, bikinis so many white people <laughs> if you've never seen them yeah. oh you'd be in for a treat uh also the dirty harry film slight difference mm-hmm. uh clint eastwood is a tough as nails cop <laughs> uh the herbie movies herbie the love bug magical mm. vw beetle Helps people in adventures. Yeah, Don Knotts Go, goes to Monte Carlo. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty. Go, go uh, Lindsay Lohan in one of them. I know yep. you're excited about that. That's it's canon. Just like I, my, I, and I and I do have the hard to find one. Oh, good. But it's on VHS, so you have to come to my place. I, I have a VHS player. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. It's in the we keep in the bedroom. Yeah. All right. All right. Wait, where it's special. Uh, and then lastly, mm. two franchises which quickly went straight to video have a big following, apparently. And uh, we defy you to tell us the difference. <laughs> because the other two franchises you can vote for are Sniper and The Marine. Uh, they all have a lot of sequels. One of, them has, one of them has a Sniper. The other one's a Marine. I think The Sniper might also be a Marine. I'm not sure. <laughs> We're going to find out. We, we don't know the difference. Vote for one and we'll see. <laughs> we'll vote. We'll review the whole franchise, whichever one you vote for. Go to Schmoville on Facebook. Check it out. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great week. And uh, never forget, everyone's a critic. I want to go to the midnight show. I'm sorry, what?